Hey there, I'm writing to you because I really think that my story is something wild. And you'll probably be able to make more sense of it than me. I live in a pretty rural town, down in Kansas. And a few months ago, I saw the strangest thing I've ever laid my eyes on. There was this one morning that I had to go to the DMV and get a new license. Mine had expired. I got up early, way earlier than normal. And overall, it seemed like a typical morning. It was then, on my drive to the DMV, when I saw it. Halfway there, I'm driving through my rural town into the more metro area of where I live, and I notice that there is some huge thing in the sky, nearly right above my car. At first, I freaked out. There was something, some flying object, in the sky. And whatever it was, it was descending to the ground and fast. I thought at first that it was a plane, and that stressed me out more than anything. Was it a terrorist attack? Was there some kind of internal malfunction? I wanted to call the police or something. But the fact is, I sort of figured someone else already had. Besides, I was in shock and wasn't reacting properly. Anyway, whatever it was, it was crashing. There was a stream of smoke coming out from behind it, clear as day. The odd thing was, as it came closer to the ground, closer into my field of vision, I realized it was definitely not a plane, or a helicopter, or anything I've seen in my life. So now I'm watching it way, way closer, because I want to see where the thing is going to drop. I know that curiosity killed the cat, but this seemed like something important, or at least abnormal enough to pay attention to. It was shaped like a CGI starship from a Marvel movie or something. It wasn't a flying saucer, but the way it was designed looked very foreign. It was gray, and for all intents and purposes, too large to go unnoticed, and too large to be in the sky for that matter. Eventually, after a short while, I see it descend closer and closer to the ground, nearby, but definitely a few miles out. I figured, hey, I'm already late for my appointment, I should go see what the hell this is about. So now I'm speeding my way towards where I saw the thing crash. I was going quick as hell, and I got there in less than 10 minutes. I parked on the side of the road because it crashed in a kind of woodsy area I could only get to on foot. I can't lie, the adrenaline was high, and I was very excited to find this thing and figure out what the hell it was. Much to my dismay though, when I got to the crash site, there was nothing there. I mean there was a hole in the ground but nothing else. It was just a massive empty crater in the middle of the woods. I thought I was going crazy. I thought first that I had imagined the entire thing. And then I tried to rationalize that I had found the wrong spot, that this wasn't really where it had landed, but I soon understood that neither of those things were the case. Nope. In actuality, the damn thing just disappeared. But I'll tell you this, it didn't disappear without a trace. I jumped down into the big hole at the crash site to have a look around, and to check that the ship wasn't, like, invisible or something. And believe it or not, I found some debris. Debris is vague, I know. But this was the really strange part. I collected all the weird rocks that were scattered at the base of the crater and shoved them in my pockets. I looked around but found nothing else strange, and so I skedaddled out of there ASAP and took off in my car. Right away I called my friend Tom who is a rock hound and amateur geologist. He analyzed them and tested their densities and checked for Moe's hardness or whatever, and tells me that the rocks I found were scraps of meteorites. That's right rocks from the sky. Insane. You might not see how this is substantial, but the fact is that if what I saw was any other known aeronautical machine, there's no way in hell it would have been up in space like it was. There's no way it would have vanished, disappeared with almost no trace. Unless, of course, it was something much rarer than any old airplane. My personal theory is that the thing teleported, that it entered our atmosphere and crashed somehow. And then by using some kind of weird technology, it got teleported back to wherever it came from before anyone else could see it. I've been scratching my head, kind of going crazy about it to be honest. Since then, I haven't seen anything strange. But that doesn't mean I haven't been on the lookout for it. I bought a huge telescope, and now I find myself frequenting some unsavory parts of the internet to try and make sense of everything I witnessed. Not a lot of people in my personal life believe me, so I'm hoping at least you will.
I'm Italian and have been waiting to get in touch with you. I want to tell you about this wild experience I had in Ravello, Italy. Ravello is this cool village on the cliffs of Italy's Amalfi Coast. My name's Carlo, by the way, and I'm just a history professor from Rome, really into stories about my country. Every summer, I take a break to go somewhere and dig into some history. This time, Ravello was my choice because of its old buildings and great views. So, I was walking around the place one evening. That night, as usually happens, when the sun went down, the streets started getting lit by lanterns. The shadows got all long, and although beautiful, were also a bit creepy. And I could smell flowers blooming, and hear the sea not too far away. Then, out of nowhere, everything suddenly went silent. It was like the whole town stopped breathing or something. Right then, I heard this weird noise, kind of like wings flapping in the wind. The silence got even more intense, except for that flapping sound. So, naturally, I got curious and decided to check it out. I followed the sound and ended up at this old, rundown cathedral that was just at the top of the hill, maybe a five-minute walk. At first, I looked around but saw nothing. I knew this church welcomed visitors at any time, and so I went inside hating how the wooden doors made this creaking sound that echoed all over. Once inside, I walked around slowly as my eyes got used to the dim light of just the candles, and I saw something I can't even begin to explain. It was off in a corner, and its movement caught my attention. At first, I thought it was a priest or other church worker, but at first, I couldn't quite tell. What confused me was that it was tall, about six feet, but looked like a mix between a man and an animal. It had black feathers all over it, and these huge leather wings, like a bat's, were on its back. I wondered at first if it was some type of ancient cloak, and that I was intruding on some unique ceremony. Let's just say that I wasn't a regular church goes, and so anything could have been the truth at that point. But anyway, the craziest part was its face, or rather, the lack of one. When this thing finally turned and looked toward me, I could tell that there were just two big red eyes glowing in the dark. Man, I was scared. My heart was beating like crazy, and I was sweating bullets. My legs felt like jelly, and I was just trying to make sense of what I was seeing. So, there I was, still inside the cathedral, my heart pounding so loudly it sounded like drums. I was sweaty, my legs were wobbly, and I couldn't stop my hands from shaking, and all the while, that thing just kept staring at me with its glowing red eyes, not moving or making a sound. You know that feeling when you lock eyes with someone and there's like a connection? It was like that, but way more intense. I felt like it knew me somehow, and it gave me the creeps. Time just seemed to stop as we stared at each other. Finally, I got up the nerve to take a step back, even though every part of me was yelling to run away. But the creature didn't move. It just kept looking at me, and then it opened its wings. Man, they were even bigger and scarier than I first thought. The rustling sound they made filled the whole place, and I couldn't help but feel a mix of amazement and terror. Then, out of nowhere, it made this sound. I can't even describe it. It wasn't a growl or a roar, but something older, more unsettling. It bounced off the walls and hit me right in the chest. And then, with one big flap, it flew up into the cathedral's roof, like up into the rafters and was then gone. I couldn't see it at all anymore. It was like it knew of a secret exit up there. That was it for me. I turned and ran out of there as fast as I could, but somehow I could feel it watching me, and I even thought I heard the soft sound of its wings as it took off. I didn't stop running until I was back in the busy main section of Ravello, where I collapsed against a wall, trying to catch my breath. I was back in reality, but I couldn't shake what had just happened. The memory of that creature, its wings and those glowing eyes was stuck in my head. I spent the rest of the night just trying to process it all. Even now, as I'm writing this down, I still feel terrified. It's just so unbelievable, so eerie. In the ensuing days, I found myself drawn back to the cathedral, back to the place of the encounter. I was driven by a strange fascination a need to understand what I had witnessed. The creature was never there, despite me stopping multiple times at different times of the day. Its existence marked only by the faint trace of an otherworldly presence. But maybe it was only me who felt that. 
The encounter changed me in ways I can still hardly comprehend. My pursuit of history, of forgotten tales and mysteries, had led me too close to something I had wanted to see. Basically, I crossed paths with a creature of legends. From then on, every creak of a door, every rustle of feathers, every hint of a shadow brought me back to that night. The creature had vanished, but its memory loomed large for me. April 2017 April 2017, I was spending the week with my mom and my new stepdad up in northern Michigan. It was 2017, and I was halfway through high school. Classes were still in session, but on account of my mom's new marriage, my brother and I were allowed to spend some extra family time together outside of school. My mom seemed to feel a vacation would somehow bring us all closer. So, we rented a cabin. It was alright, I guess. It was a quaint little place with a bit of a kitschy country feel, not like the city where I was used to living. I thought my new stepdad was a little weird. He liked to tell stories about werewolves and other creepy cryptid creatures. He believed they were all somehow related. In my opinion, the creatures were one and the same, but that was only based on what had I heard, not actual facts. My stepdad was convinced he'd actually seen one of the creatures when he was a boy. I guess that's what started his whole infatuation with the idea. I personally have never been one to blindly believe anything anyone told me. I needed proof. The dog man, for example, was a highly unlikely being, a creature with a man's body and the head of a dog. I had a strong interest in biology, and the whole thing just didn't add up genetically. On that fateful day when everything changed, I had just entered the dining room. My brother was just about to take a bite out of his sandwich. He could see the look on my and my stepdad's faces, and his eyes shifted from our stepdad, and then to me. We both were staring over my brother's shoulder and out the window behind him. My stepdad and I exchanged astonished glances. We just couldn't believe what was happening. There, in the backyard, was a man hunkered over with his head in our charcoal grill. It was odd behavior to say the least. My stepdad had made us all steak and a salad for lunch but the surface of the grill had been cooled to the touch for some time, so why anyone would want to sniff the bricks of coal was beyond me. I think my brother thought we were staring at him. He lowered his sandwich down toward his plate as if being silently judged. My stepdad and I, of course, weren't judging anyone. We continued to watch in horror as the man lifted his shaggy mane and sniffed around. It was then we realized this was no ordinary man. In fact, it wasn't a man at all. The shirtless human male torso appeared to be chestnut brown in color. Yet the head was what captivated us the most. Long strands of hair, wispy and thick like a Pomeranian, painted on in thick coats of jet black, coppery red, and a shock of white, stretched out on both sides of its face. Oh, but the eyes. The eyes were what kept us mesmerized. They were both a piercing amber color. I had never seen anything so strange and so beautiful in my entire life. The creature straightened his stance. He knew he'd been seen and that we were watching him. I tugged on my stepdad's shirt sleeve. We sprinted from the dining room through the kitchen toward the back door and towards the patio area. We both charged for the door. My stepdad beat me there, but I wasn't upset. All I could think about was getting a better look at the creature outside. Once my stepdad and I stumbled our way out into the open, the impossibly tall dog-like man began to back up while still staring at both of us. I reached out my hand, unsure if the creature would act like a dog or a man. To my utter amazement, the creature howled. At least, I think it was a howl. It kind of sounded like a human screaming. Its teeth were long and curved, like miniature spikes, only much thinner. They were still bigger in size than a large breed canine's teeth. None of them were jagged like in the urban legends I'd heard in the past. My blood began to curdle and I started to seriously wonder why we had come outside. Both of my palms started to sweat and my heart raced like crazy inside my chest. Fight or flight had kicked in and I wished desperately it would all go away. But I couldn't. I had forgotten how to move. My stepdad hadn't though. He had slipped his cell phone deftly out of his back pants pocket and was lifting it to capture a few seconds of live footage. Upon seeing the phone, the creature spun around quickly. 
Now I could see that its lower torso appeared to be that of a canine. It was strange to watch it run off on two feet, and I actually doubted that I was really seeing what I was seeing. In my opinion, I don't think canines were ever meant to run as bipeds. It gives them a strange kind of gait, or at least this one was strange. It almost bounced as I watched it bob up and down in a blur of speed. I stared after it for a long time eventually staring at the spot where it ran off into the trees. My stepdad looked almost giddy with a huge grin on his face. I'd never seen him smile so big in all the time I'd known him. I was astonished that he wasn't afraid at all, and I was hoping he had gotten some footage, but when I peeked over to watch his video, the image was distorted. My stepdad frowned and scratched his head. His spirits had now clearly plummeted. I kind of felt bad for him. He'd waited so long to prove the existence of these wild creatures, and now it had shown up and he had no proof, other than the fact that my brother and I had both seen it. In some strange way, witnessing the dogman so close and in person had brought me and my stepdad a little closer than we once were. I guess we now had more in common since I know believed, just like him. We headed back inside the house, not in defeat, but as a newly formed team in search of the truth. I know it exists, he knows it exists, and now you know it too. That is, as long as you believe what I'm saying. My suggestion is to never stop believing in these creatures. I know I won't. Some things can't be rationalized or explained. I understand that. I know when some things are more make-believe than factual. But I have to admit, I found myself in one heck of a dilemma that summer night. I'm not one for ghost stories. My grandparents sure liked telling them when I was growing up. But they weren't for me. I liked reality, even as a kid. So that's what makes this encounter so difficult for me to express. Because I cannot explain with certainty what all had happened. Being part of law enforcement, we are taught to think with logic and factually accurate information. And even though our town was a bit into folklore and all of that, we knew what was real and what wasn't. That's how it was to me then. Black and white. Fact and fiction. I've mentioned I've heard stories about spooky things. So I was familiar with some of the crazy things people dreamed up. But I never gave them much weight. Anyhow, I was working one day. It was hot. It was the middle of summer. This particular day, we had been called to help a lady. She said that some delinquents were harassing her and her kids. She said they'd been doing some awful things like throwing rocks at her kids in their house. One had even taken out one of her windows. The woman was furious, as one might imagine. She said that her kids had been playing in the backyard and that they had seen someone in the trees. She said that they were throwing rocks at her kids. So her kids do what kids do. Monkey see, monkey do. You know the saying. And her kids start throwing rocks. They think it's some fun game that they got going on. But one of the kids gets a rock to the head. The woman thought her kid had a concussion. But they didn't. They were fine. But the problem was that they continued to do it. And someone else was teaching them to do it. This was many decades ago. So teaching your kids right from wrong was very straight and narrow. If I had that woman for a mother, I would have been scared to get the belt, you know what I mean? But the woman said she was wanting to get to the bottom of the behavior and hold the juveniles accountable for teaching her kids such awful behavior. I agreed with the woman. Something needed to be done. So we went to the woman's home. Sure enough, one of her windows was busted out, and one of the kids was still walking around with a bandage wrapped all the way around their head. It was a bit unusual. The situation. Sometimes I still think about it. Something just seemed off right off the bat. But what we discovered was much darker than some teenagers being knuckleheads. We interviewed the children and the mother. The mother just kept talking about how those kids needed to be punished. And where were their parents? Sometimes, when someone is so worked up like that, the best thing to do is nod your head. Because nobody, I mean nobody, is going to change their mind. That's how my mother was too. And my sister, all of us and our family really. When we have our minds made up, good luck. So then we start talking to the children. The oldest one stated that they were outside playing tag and that someone had been throwing rocks. So they started throwing rocks back. 
They said it was to teach the other person a lesson at first, but that it eventually turned into a fun game. The middle child, the one with the bandage, had said that they'd been playing this game for a couple of weeks now. They hadn't seen the kid who was playing with them, but that they were starting to make good friends. The youngest, they had the most information. They said that the kid in the woods was more like a man and that they could see their eyes in the trees, that they smelt awfully bad. But they then said, Mama says we can't make fun of people for that. So we made friends. At this point, I'm starting to fear that the children are interacting with a town squatter. But I don't tell the mother anything. I didn't want to frighten her. I stayed several days at the house. But it wasn't until the fourth day that the rock started to hit the house again. The woman was angry and she started pacing around her house shouting all sorts of things. But I told her that she needed to keep it down so I could catch the perpetrator in the act. She did as much, but she didn't like it. I quietly made my way outside and my way out towards the back. Sure enough, rocks were flying past my head, so I had to keep ducking. Eventually, I found myself behind a big pile of firewood, and I just stayed behind that. Those rocks weren't stopping, so I had to start yelling at the person, but it didn't make much difference. Finally, I peeked my head around the side of the firewood, and I could see whoever it was hiding being the trees. It was a dark figure, and it smelled terrible, just like the child had said, and it looked as if it were watching me. The rocks finally stopped. I'm not sure if it was because they didn't have any more to throw, or if it was because it saw me looking at them. So I edged closer to the perpetrator, but it ran away fast. Before it did, I got a bit more of a look at it, and truth be told, that thing was covered in dark hair. Now I told you I don't do ghost stories or anything like that, but I can't quite explain what was throwing those rocks. You hear these stories growing up, and you think, that's not true, no way. But I'm realizing the world isn't as black and white as I thought. Maybe there is some gray area in between. I can't believe I'm writing this, but I've got to get this down just so I don't think I'm crazy. My sister and I have always been close. When we moved out after college, we stayed in roughly the same area, so we made a point of visiting often, until 2019 anyway, because she moved several hours north for a new job. I promised I would drive up to see her and her new place as soon as I could, but the pandemic hit and I had to delay my trip for about a year and a half. When I was finally able to go, I was so excited. I was looking forward to seeing my sister and getting some peace and quiet. Two days before I was supposed to go, Janet called me and she seemed, I don't know, a little off. She teased me about little things like remembering to pack my toothbrush and extra socks, but she sounded kind of nervous. Then she told me that it was very important that I get an early start so I would get there before dark. I brushed it off because she's always made fun of me for being a late riser, but then she repeated it and said it was serious because the road to her house always gets dark super fast. She even made me promise that I would leave early to get there before sundown. I didn't see why it was such a big deal because I drive home from work at night all the time, but I figured she was just being a typical overprotective big sister, so I promised. We said goodbye and hung up. Fast forward to the day of the trip. I set my alarm early, but it didn't go off, so I overslept and had to start way later than I wanted. I felt bad because I'd promised, but it wasn't really my fault anyway, so oh well, right? At first, nothing out of the ordinary happened. But once I left the city and started on that long stretch of highway that cuts through the middle of nowhere, some weird stuff started happening. I'd look at the time and then I'd blink, and it would be like 30 minutes later, or my radio would cut out suddenly, or switch channels on its own. The longer I drove, the more frequent the weird stuff became. It started off slow but ramped up to something happening every couple of minutes. And then the sun set. Okay, I thought Janet was over exaggerating when she told me about this. And you probably think I'm over exaggerating now. But I swear it was practically instantaneous. One minute it was sunshine. And the next I could barely see in front of me even with the headlights on. It was like the night just slammed down on my car. I must have gotten confused at some point because I somehow found myself driving down a narrow side road away from the main highway that I was supposed to take. It cut right through the surrounding woods, 
and the trees were practically touching the sides of my car. I thought about trying to turn around, but I quickly realized it wasn't possible. I checked my GPS app and saw that if I just kept going for a couple more miles, there would be a spot where I could merge back onto the main road. As I drove, I started getting this really creepy feeling like I was being watched. I told myself that I was just tired and spooked from the long drive. I mean, I was in the middle of nowhere at night. Nobody was out here but me, right? I managed to calm myself down, but barely a minute passed before I heard the most terrifying sound ever. It was a high-pitched shriek, and I thought it was an animal, but somehow it sounded eerily human. It startled me so bad that I automatically pressed the gas a little harder. Everything happened so fast. First, I felt the car dip. Then there was a loud bang. Then I jerked the steering wheel hard to the right to get away from the noise. But the car just sort of dragged. I took my foot off the gas. My heart was beating so fast I thought I'd die. It took me a second to calm down enough to realize that I'd probably just blown a tire. According to GPS, I was really close to the highway. I called Janet to let her know what had happened. She said she'd pick me up, but she sounded very worried. She said to walk the rest of the road to the highway and don't hang up. I was nervous about traveling alone and on foot, but it was a short walk and I was still on the phone with Janet, so I felt a little better. I had almost reached the edge of the trees when this awful stench hit my nose. It was definitely something rotten and decaying. I don't know what death smells like, but I'm sure this must be it. Then it happened. A blood-curdling shriek, just like before, but closer this time. Much, much closer. And it sounded like it was directly behind me. I turned around and I swear that for a second I saw a pair of glowing red dots like eyes but they disappeared behind the trees. I freaked out and started sprinting for the highway. I don't know why, but somehow I was certain that something was pursuing me and that it was just letting me go because it wanted to. There were no more screams, but that horrible smell stayed. After that, it was a blur. I just remember vague flashes, reaching the highway, getting in Janet's car, walking in her front door. I don't think either of us said more than a couple words. The next morning, everything was weirdly normal. Janet was oddly chipper and gushed about being so glad to see me. My car was even parked in her driveway with all four tires intact. I tried to talk to her about what happened last night, but she just kept saying vague stuff about how it must have been a tiring drive and how she always had weird dreams after a long trip. Maybe it was just a weird dream. Janet and I had a great time catching up and swimming in the nearby lake. Everything was perfect until it was time for me to go home. I hadn't gone into my car since I got to Janet's place, and when I opened my car door, I got hit full in the face by a horrible stench, rot and decay. It was the same horrible smell as that night in the woods. If the smell is real, then what else about that night is real? I don't know if I want to find out. I'm a plumber, been doing it for over 25 years now. The job's taken me to all sorts of weird and wonderful places, but none were as strange as this place was. A half-abandoned building, nestled on the edge of a neglected part of town that was better off forgotten. It was late October, the chill of the fall air was starting to seep in. My boots crunched on the gravel as I pulled up. When I first got the call about a plumbing emergency out there, I thought it was some kind of prank. But the request came from the city office. They said the building was in use for some government stock or something. Who am I to judge? A job is a job. The looming structure cut an imposing figure against the dull gray sky. Its weathered bricks had seen better days, and the windows were boarded up, giving off an eerie vibe. The skeletal trees surrounding it didn't do much to dissuade my growing sense of unease either. It felt quiet, too quiet like the world held its breath around this place. As I approached the entrance, the smell hit me first. An unpleasant mix of dampness and decay, not uncommon for old buildings, but this was stronger somehow, more pervasive. A faint chirping of the crickets was the only sound cutting into the dead silence, as if nature itself was afraid to disturb this building. I found the busted pipe in the basement. The water flow had been shut off from the main, but there was a musty smell that hung in the air, an undercurrent of something acrid, 
almost sulfuric. It was different, off. The pipe looked gnashed, covered in scrapes and dents. I figured the building's age was causing the infrastructure to crumble, but something about it didn't seem right. It almost looked like bite marks. I shrugged off the thought, reasoning it was probably some vermin or a raccoon. The basement was in dire need of a cleanup job. Among the dust cobweb corners and scattered debris, I noticed a pile of old furniture shrouded in a thick, moth-eaten cloth. The air felt heavy, oppressive, and despite myself, I felt a chill run down my spine. Kneeling down by the damaged pipe, my flashlight began to flicker. I remember thinking, just my luck. The silence was deafening around me, interrupted only by the low hum of my tools and the sporadic, flickering light painting grotesque shadows all around. Suddenly, the temperature seemed to drop drastically. A chill swept through the room like an all-consuming fog, the sort of chill that sinks deep into your bones. That's when I heard it, a low guttural growl echoing from the unseen corners of the basement. It was distant, barely audible, but it was there, a rumbling growl, like that of a dog but deeper, resonating within that cold, quiet basement. But those were thoughts for later. I shrugged both the cold and the growl, attributing it to the wind howling outside. After all, I had a pipe to fix. No sooner had I pushed these unsettling thoughts aside that I heard it again, this time louder, more menacing. A low growling sound that seemed to vibrate through the emptiness. I shook it off once more, but I felt my mind pull itself back to those strange dents on the pipe. The thought of a raccoon making those marks somehow seemed less plausible. I heard the odd sound once more, louder and much clearer than before. It was unmistakably a growl, guttural and menacing. A primal fear began to seep into my veins. That's when I noticed, amongst the rat-infested pile and dust-covered debris movement, slow but deliberate. An ominous shadow was all I saw, hunched and lurking. Just the sight of the shadow struck me cold. It was huge, easily seven to nine feet, and it was not human. Right then, every fiber of my being screamed to bolt, to get away from this place as fast as possible. There, standing in that basement with the damaged pipe and the low growling that hung in the silence, I felt a fear I hadn't felt since childhood. The mysterious creature, the ruined pipe, those growls, it all made a horrific sense. Collecting my nerves, I started to pack up my tools. My mind was ordering my hands to work faster, but icy terror made them sluggish, clumsy. The growling was getting louder, closer. As I finally picked up my tool bag, my flashlight flared back to life, and for a moment, it illuminated the beast behind the growl. I would never forget what I saw, a creature with the look of a hyena, a face that was nothing short of demonic. It had a snarling mouth filled with double rows of razor-sharp fangs and large pointy ears. Its body, hunched on human-like legs, was covered in dark fur. Its chest, wide and powerful, spoke of unnerving strength. I saw the eyes just as my flashlight flickered and died again, intelligent and cold with an unworldly intensity. In what felt like a purely instinctive response, I turned and fled, leaving all my tools behind. The growls seemed to follow me as I sprinted up the stairs, echoing through the building. I couldn't, wouldn't, look back. I threw myself into my van, hit the gas, and got the hell out of there. Months have gone by since that chilling encounter, but its memory is as fresh as if it happened yesterday. I can still feel the cold dread when I remember that night in the basement with the thing. The damp, musty smell, sulfuric, almost like wet dog mixed with rotting meat. The chilling echo of that growl. The way it looked at me, every time I pass by an old, forgotten building, I feel an involuntary shudder. An intense sense of wariness washes over me. City officials dismiss my claims, saying wild animals were normal for abandoned structures. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But one thing's for sure, not a single person has been able to explain the strange destruction of that pipe. Now, I can't help but wonder what else might be lurking out there, in the shadowy corners of forgotten places, living, existing amongst us. The thought shakes me with a startling realization. 
Sometimes, the most disturbing things hide where no one thinks to look, just like that half-abandoned building. It was spring of 2014, and I was staying with friends in Salt Lake City for a few days. The weather was fantastic, the roads were clear, and it seemed like the perfect time to stretch my legs and head out on a solo overnight trip to see some great hiking trails. I had never hiked in Utah before, but I was excited to see some of its beautiful forests and trails and to just check out for a few days. I found that there are many websites that gave direction as to where is good to explore, and also some visual imagery books online that provided detailed accounts on certain trails for people who want to explore on their own. This saved me a lot of money and time by planning out the trails for myself. So, I drove the four hour or so trip south to Dixie National Forest, found a beautiful spot to camp and settled in. The beautiful rock formations made me think I might stay longer than I had intended. It was absolutely gorgeous. An hour or so later, I ventured out and found a nice trailhead with a little bit of everything. Mountains with waterfalls, cliffs, small caves and forest. I had my backpack ready with plenty of water and snacks, along with a camera and first aid kit. I had never hiked with so many beautiful things to look at. In fact, I was starting to feel overwhelmed on which trail I should take and wanted to be sure to see all the best stuff. There were not very many people out hiking yet, and after a few hours my mind started playing tricks on me. It seemed like there was always someone in the shadows of every corner. Was this my imagination, or was something else going on? Maybe I just really needed to relax and clear my head. Maybe this weirdness was just detoxing the real world out of my system. Anyway, I stayed alert and just walked forward. I didn't venture off the trail since I did not want to be careless in case there may have been bears or other wild animals lurking around. I was also thinking there might be snakes hiding off the trails, and I'm crazy stupid scared of those. After about another hour of walking, the sun suddenly went down, and it became very dark. I wasn't used to it getting so dark so fast since that doesn't seem to happen where I live. And now I found myself where there were no lights anywhere and I could barely see further than 30 or 40 feet ahead of me. Luckily I had a headlamp in my pack and I put it on to see where I was going. I didn't want to admit quite yet that I might not be heading in the direction I needed to be. It wasn't long until I started noticing that the trees around me looked very odd. Their bark looked unusual and I started to think that they looked like figures swaying in the dark. Their branches also made strange sounds as if something was moving underneath them. My curiosity, okay, it was really fear, became too overwhelming, so I stopped to take photos of it all with my camera, telling myself it was a really cool photo opportunity. I set the delay on the camera and started taking pictures. I told myself for documentation purposes. That's when I noticed just how quiet it really was around me. No birds, no crickets, not even the sound of trees blowing in the wind, even though I was clearly watching them move. At this point, I knew there was a good chance I may have been lost, so I wanted to keep looking for the trail markers, hoping to find something I knew. I didn't want to turn back because that was obviously not the right direction. I had packed my hiking sticks with me, so I pulled them out figuring it would be easy if I just needed to jab something that looked dangerous or out of the ordinary. And right when I got them out and started walking with them, that's when I saw it. The thing was about 10 yards away, and he was staring directly at me, his eyes gleaming back in the reflection of my headlamp. He looked like a dog, with a dog head and dog eyes, but his body was massive compared to his head size. He was probably 7 feet tall and just loomed over everything around. I froze. My head was trying to figure out why this dog would be so big. And then, all of a sudden, all of my senses kicked in, and I realized that I was in deep danger. I trembled uncontrollably and couldn't run. That thing was standing on two legs and started to walk towards me, slowly. Which seems like a good thing, but the confidence in its slow, purposeful walk was the scariest thing I've ever seen. It was so surreal because it walked like a human while having mostly only dog features from the neck up. But then its arms were so long, and his hands were like dog paws, and they were massive. I had to run. My brain knew that I had to run, but my legs weren't responding. 
I turned the headlamp towards the trail and headed as fast as I could down the trail trying to find markers of any kind, basically hoping I was headed in the right direction. But the creature followed, and he was breathing heavily behind me, close enough for me to hear it. I was all too aware of his hot breath raging out of his mouth, and my head was pounding, and the blood rushing through it sounded like thunder in my ears. The creature's dog paws hitting the ground was loud too, loud enough that I could tell he was close to me. At one point, I turned around to look and was dumbfounded to see that he was running only on his back legs, just like a human would run, and now I was able to see what he looked like in full view. His eyes were glowing and his mouth was dripping with saliva. His fur was moving as it ran, and then there was the smell. It was all terrifying, and then, in what seemed like a split second, before I could do anything, he was right next to me, almost as if like magic and he swatted at me but I dodged away just in time before turning and continuing to run for my life. The thing's dog claws cut through my long sleeve shirt and barely missed my skin. The thought of getting seriously injured or even killed ran through my mind. It was all too real at this point. I knew I had to get out of there. Fast. Before this thing got another chance at me, since he was obviously very fast, very smart and very sneaky. I kept running as fast as my legs could move until the creature finally gave up chasing me. It just totally disappeared as quickly as it had appeared. I knew it had given up or basically decided to stop on its own because it had already proved to be much faster than I could have ever run. And next all I was aware of was that I could hear a dog barking in the distance. Was it the creature or someone's pet? Hopefully someone's pet. But the barking seemed to be getting further and further away with each passing second, so I couldn't figure it out. The truth is that the barking actually made me feel a little bit safer thinking that maybe it was just a regular pet dog after all, but I still didn't know for sure so I kept running, hoping to find someone who could help me. And then, just like that, I came across a trail marker that I had never seen before. I studied it for a second and then realized that it was taking me in the right direction. So from there on out, I pretty much just followed the markers and eventually made my way back to camp. I can't tell you how this encounter has completely changed my life. It's been over seven years at this point, and I still won't solo camp or head out on the hiking trails alone. The fear of being alone is so strong for me now. I just hope that someday I can put this trauma behind me and get back to being myself. Even now that creature runs through my head every time I go out on the trails with friends, and I truly feel like something bad is going to happen, that the thing is always there. Honestly, that encounter still haunts me to this day, like some sort of unreal dream, but very real. I'm scared. I just don't know if I will ever be myself again. On a positive note, I did get a picture of the creature while it was chasing me. I just need to figure out how to get it online. I have a story from my time as a state police officer in northwestern Montana. There were a few odd situations over the years, but nothing compares to this. I was sent out to a rural homestead to investigate a complaint of property damage and potential theft. The homestead was an off-grid cabin about as deep in the mountains as you could get while still having access to a halfway decent road in the winter to make it to and from town. The couple that lived there were odd, to say the least. They were mostly self-sustainable out there. They raised a few farm animals and grew a lot of their own food and stored it over the winter in a root cellar. It was nearing the end of fall and most of the mountain roads were closed for the winter. The drive up to the cabin was a little hairy, but I made it okay. When I arrived, the only thing I knew was that something happened involving the root cellar, but I waited for them to tell me their story. And it was quite the story at that. It began last summer. They noticed food going missing from their garden. They figured it was the local wildlife and installed a fence around the garden. But food continued to disappear. The garden was done for the season, but I checked the fence. It was eight feet tall, and there were no signs of animals getting through or under the fence. The only way into the garden was through a gate, and the couple both said they never once found the gate unlatched. They installed a mess cover on top of the fence, 
to prevent any birds or animals that could climb the fence. There was truly nowhere that an animal could get through this fence. Now, wildlife eating through people's gardens is definitely a problem out here, but it wasn't something you'd call the police for. After harvesting the garden and moving everything into the root cellar, someone or something began breaking in and stealing food from there. And here is where it gets weird. There were no signs of any animals, no prints, no scat. The door to the root cellar was not damaged in any way, but there was a significant amount of things missing. They told me that pretty much everything in there was stored in various sizes of mason jars. The entire jars were missing. Nothing was knocked on the ground, just vanished. If the food thief was an animal of some sort, we'd expect to see jars on the ground and things damaged or broken in the cellar, but there was none of that. The man just looked at me. I could tell he wanted to speak, but something stopped him. I told him to go ahead, that I've probably heard stranger theories. He told me he had been watching the root cellar through the window every night for the past two weeks, and he finally saw the culprit. He said it was a human, but it wasn't a normal human. He didn't know whether to call the police or fish and wildlife. I asked him to elaborate, and he said he saw the thief heading to the cellar just after dark, and it was definitely a person. The lack of outside lights made it difficult to see, but he went outside to confront the suspected food thief and scare him off. He met him coming out of the cellar carrying a leather bag full of mason jars. The man said he was human, but he wasn't human like we were. He had a large brow ridge and deep-set eyes. His face and body were square-shaped, and he was only maybe five feet tall. He was wearing boots and clothes that appeared to be made from fur and animal hide. The man said it was like looking at some prehistoric history book. He yelled at the thief and it took off running towards the forest, but before it did, it reached into its bag and tried to hand the man something. He didn't take it, but the person or creature or whatever dropped it on the ground and ran. He followed the thief to the edge of the forest, but it was too dark to try to track whatever it was. He went back to inspect the root cellar and see what all had been taken. It was at that moment that he looked on the ground for what the creature tried to offer him. There were arrowheads, spear points, and a couple of other stone tools. I had absolutely no idea what to do about this case. I took the arrowheads for evidence, but I didn't have anything else to go on. We couldn't find a trail in the forest to even attempt to track the creature. I was straight with the couple. I told them there wasn't much I could do here. They asked if anyone else in the area had been seeing these people. The man was convinced that there are, I don't know how to say it without sounding crazy, but cave people living out in the mountains completely isolated from the rest of society. He said he wasn't sure if they were a separate species of human or not, but that they could be the cause for all the Bigfoot stories in the area. I can't say if I believed him or not. I never saw the creature. I did, however, follow up with the couple in the spring of the year. They were both out working in the garden when I arrived and had expanded it quite a bit. And strangely, they said they weren't having any problems anymore. On my way back to my vehicle, I glanced at the root cellar. The door had a display of arrowheads along the top that wasn't there last fall. I didn't ask any more questions. Looking back, I wished I had, but at the same time, I don't think I was ready to know what exactly lives out there in the mountains. Hi Donovan, I've been a big fan of your channel over the last few months, but have always been a bit skeptical of the stories I have heard. I'm not skeptical anymore. Something happened to me this weekend, and I'm hoping someone out there can shed some light on it. I'm big into cycling and spend most of my free time training or competing in events. I live in Central PA, and most of the competitive events in my area happen during the summer months, so I spend fall and winter staying in shape and getting in as much bike time as possible. My goal this day was to hit a 70 mile round trip in five hours. For some cyclists, that's almost a leisurely stroll, but I live in a mountainous area and am riding uphill for a good portion of that time. I left around 11 a.m. and planned to be back just before dark at around five. The first leg of my ride was pleasant if a little cold. Despite a lot of sharp curves, there isn't much traffic in the area so I don't have to be overly cautious of cars. The trouble came on my way back. It was around 2.30 p.m. when I turned around to make the trip home. 
I had lost some time as I had run into a few other cyclists I knew and spent a little time chatting with them. In passing, they had mentioned seeing some military vehicles, but I didn't really think much of it, though there weren't any military bases nearby. So, riding a little harder than usual, I started home hoping to still reach my front door by 5 p.m. It didn't take long before I hit a literal roadblock. There was a deep green Humvee stretched across the narrow road, and three men in forest camouflage standing around. Two were holding what looked like assault rifles, and the third was sitting behind the wheel. I was told the road beyond was impassable due to a rock slide, and I would need to take an alternate route. Explaining that I could navigate through on my bike came to no avail, and that I was basically SOL. I know that the military responding to such an insignificant incident was odd, but didn't really give it much thought, as all my attention was drawn to the fact that the only other route home I knew was going to take me two hours out of my way. Passes through the mountains are few and far between. So, I turned back around and began my extended ride home. Calling it a road does it more justice than it deserves. It was a single lane pothole nightmare and I always avoided it for just that reason, but it's all I had. Going slower than normal, because of the poor road conditions, I began making my way down it. After about 30 minutes, I was beginning to think that maybe it wasn't so bad. The road seemed to have been patched in a few places, and some of the lower hanging tree limbs had been trimmed. I was slowing down to take a drink of water from my bottle when I caught something from the corner of my eye. It was moving as fast as I, whatever it was. I thought maybe it was a deer or something, but it had more of a loping gait than a deer's prance. Not really concerned, I came to a full stop to try to get a better look. It was behind a thick patch of brush about 30 yards away. It was hard to make out any details, but it was covered in muddied brown fur. Thinking it might be a black bear, I started pedaling again, keeping my eyes on it. Bears nearly never attack people, but I figured it's best not to chance it. Then it stood up. Its head crested the seven-foot-high patch of bushes. An elongated muzzle like a wolf sat in front of a pair of narrow amber eyes. It opened its maw and let out an almost human-like scream. I took off down the road, pumping as fast as my legs would let me. I heard it crash through the forest undergrowth as it leapt out onto the road behind me. Despite being on an uneven road, I had to be going over 30 miles per hour, and it was keeping up with me. I could hear its padded footsteps coming from behind, and it let out another skin-crawling howl. I have never ridden so hard in my entire life. Ten minutes. Then fifteen minutes. Then twenty minutes later, this thing was still behind me. If it wasn't for the pure adrenaline of terror, I would have collapsed already. Anytime I felt even the slightest urge to slow, the creature let out another feral scream and my energy became renewed. At one point, I came to a sharp curve and one of those blind spot mirrors was mounted along the roadside. It had been knocked out of place and was positioned so I could see what was behind me. It was running on all fours. Fangs bared as globs of saliva flew back from its mouth. I glimpsed a foot with several dagger-like claws extending from it. Through the mirror, me and the beast made quick eye contact and seeing its quarry's face, it let out another human howl and quickened its pace. I was nearing the point of exhaustion and knew that I couldn't keep the pace any longer. Involuntarily beginning to slow, I had mental flashes of being torn to shreds by the creature. Just as it started to catch up, a light appeared on the road ahead. I couldn't see the vehicle yet, but waved my arms frantically. As it got closer, I could see it was another military Humvee, and it began to slow. I heard one last howl behind me and the creature disappeared into the forest alongside the road. The truck came to a stop just as I reached it, and several soldiers jumped out. They began questioning why I was there and how I'd gotten past the checkpoint. I explained there was no checkpoint and that I was just on my way home. One of the soldiers walked away talking into a radio, and the others began to question why I waved them down and why I was so obviously distraught. The story just flooded out of my mouth, and throughout they continued giving each other looks, and one even took a few notes. When I was done, one of the soldiers told me that the rock slide in the area must have agitated the few bears around, and that's what I had seen. I tried explaining that was not the case at all, but he insisted that I had seen a bear. 
The man who walked away came back to confirm that no checkpoint was placed on the road, and they offered to give me a ride the rest of the way. I don't think I was really being given a choice and would have accepted anyway. They didn't say a word on the ride, and where they eventually left me off was a short distance from my house. I know without any doubt in my mind that it wasn't a bear. Whatever that thing was, well, you can't find it in a zoo, that's for sure. Has anybody else seen anything like this? I don't know how this past winter was for you in whatever state you're living in, but over here in western Pennsylvania, it was pretty crazy, crazier than usual, which is saying a lot considering we're a state that gets hit with tons of snow every year. I think somewhere around 100 inches or so every year. Like I said, it's a lot of snow. You better get used to it if you're living out here. Another thing we have a lot here in Pennsylvania is wildlife, which brings me to the reason why I'm writing you. Last winter I found tracks outside my barn this one morning. Tracks I don't quite understand. They're clearly made from a canine, but no canine I know gets this big. I'll have to upload the pictures and send them to you via email. But I didn't want to waste your time, so I thought I'd reach out to you first, get confirmation that it's okay and send them over. They're pretty large in size, easily 12 inches if not bigger. We're talking huge canine tracks. Whatever made this had to have easily been the size of a grizzly bear, if not bigger. I know that doesn't even sound possible, but I cannot think for the life of me, what dog breed can make these? The other thing that really bothers me is the track pattern is not quadrupedal, meaning it isn't from a four-legged animal. Judging by the way the stride is, it appears to be more bipedal. You can clearly see the stride pattern. It's like somebody was walking on two legs, walking around. And the other weird thing, wearing fake, werewolf canted boots. The impression in the snow is quite deep, meaning that whatever made these tracks not only had tremendous stride, but must have weighed a considerable amount. I'm around 270 pounds, a bigger guy if you will, and I'm six foot two. Even me with all my snow gear on, and my boots can't even make half the indent as these do. So something is out there doing this. I know of dogmen, and I've heard their legends all around the entire Great Lakes area, from Wisconsin to Michigan, and even all over western Pennsylvania. I've never seen one myself, but I've heard many stories from friends and family growing up. I never really wanted to believe they existed, but now I guess I have no choice but to second guess. The footprints actually come out of a small section of woods that back up to acres and acres of national forest. The small section of woods kind of tails out down to around where my house is and where the neighborhood is. I would say from my pond to the small section of woods or tree line is maybe 100 yards, but I haven't actually measured. The tracks lead all the way from the tree line to my barn and then just seem to disappear. There are no traces of which direction it went, and I don't think it jumped on my roof considering my barn is roughly 20 plus feet high. So I'm not really sure what to make of this, the tracks just literally disappear right as they go up against my barn. And it's the back side of the barn where there's no window, there's no door. I currently do not have any live animals, just old hay and old barn supplies. So I'm not sure if there was anything remotely interesting for whatever animal making this to get into. I don't know. I have far more questions than answers, and I'm hoping with your aid you can help me answer many of them. Thanks for your time. People around here are pretty superstitious. The land is old. These mountains were forged from the depths of the earth when all the continents were one form. Like a giant island alone in the ocean. There's a lot of history in this place. And there are old things that live deep in the mountains that the locals don't like to talk about. People here are superstitious for a reason. I'll admit that most of the time it's just old ghost stories meant to keep kids from venturing too far into the woods. A lot of these stories came from a time that kids would have the freedom to go out and roam the neighborhood all day as long as they were back by dark, where there was nothing much to actually worry about. However, sometimes the scary stories are justified. In some dark parts of the world there are in fact monsters. My first experience with them was over 35 years ago. I was 9 years old at the time. 
I lived in a little trailer house on the edge of town with my mom. We lived in the part of town where the city came the country. Luckily, I was able to walk to a few of my friends' houses during the summer. My other way into town was to cut through my neighbor's yard and walk about a mile through the forest. I had to cross a railroad track and then pass by an abandoned church. In those days, the stories around town were that the church was haunted. People said that demons took over and would come up out of the ground at night and cause all kinds of trouble for anyone who dares get too close. They said the demons were so powerful that none of the priests within 100 miles could get rid of them. They even brought an exorcist and it was said that the exorcist ran out screaming. Of course, those were just stories. The reality was much, much worse. My encounter happened on a summer night in late August. It was nearly dark and I was heading home from my friend's house in town. My mom insisted that if it was dark out to walk home along the road. She didn't want me near the old church. At the time, I didn't know the demon stories and she never said why to avoid the church. But that night, I was running late and didn't want to get in trouble so I took the path through the woods. I figured I would be fine because I knew the route like the back of my hand. I remember getting into the woods and hearing all the sounds of the night. The wind in the trees, frogs croaking, and crickets chirping. There were lightning bugs lighting up the whole forest in front of me. I thought it looked like a magic forest. It was only a couple of minutes before I reached the church when all of a sudden everything stopped. No frogs. No crickets. The wind died and the air grew stagnant. Even the lightning bugs disappeared. I knew there was something wrong, so I picked up my pace and tried to get out of there quickly. I heard something moving around inside the church. It sounded like it had claws or long nail and it was scraping them on the walls. I didn't want to think of what it could be. I had hoped it was just a raccoon or something like it, but I knew in the bottom of my stomach that it wasn't. Next, I saw eyes peeking out of the window. I turned to run, but something stopped me dead in my tracks. It was my mother calling my name. I heard her voice and it was coming from inside the church. I turned around to look and I heard her call my name again. And then she asked me for help. She wanted me to go into the church. It was my mother's voice, but I knew in my heart it wasn't her. She wouldn't ask me to do that after insisting I didn't come this way. Something was off about it, but at nine years old, I didn't quite grasp what was going on. Mom? I called out but received no answer. The noises were still coming from the church, though. I could hear whatever it was moving around. A moment passed that felt like a lifetime, and suddenly the door squeaked open. Standing there in the doorway was a pale creature in the shape of a human. It was crouched down on all fours, ghostly white and bald with big yellow eyes. Its skin looked unhealthy and its eyes were sunken. I couldn't see a discernal nose. From a distance, its face almost looked like a naked skull. It looked straight at me and called my name with my mother's voice. I freaked out and ran all the way home. I ran so fast that I couldn't even turn around to see if the thing was chasing me. I never went back near that old church again, and to this day, I don't go outside at night without a flashlight and a knife. And to be honest, I prefer to not be outside at night at all. It took me until my 20s to even talk about my experience to anyone. I was too scared. Scared that people might not believe me, but I was even more scared that if I talked about it, I might see another one. As if speaking of them could make them real and bring them to me. Luckily, that proved not to be the case. However, after eventually pestering some of the older folks in my town, I did finally find out what it was. In a way, they are called Earth Dwellers. Some people say they predate the existence of even the mountains. It has a name, but it cannot be said aloud. If you say it's bad luck, very bad luck. These creatures were probably around when the dinosaurs lived, but in a different form. Not only do they mimic sounds and voices, they mimic form. However, their mimics are never exact. All the stories are the same. All the people who have heard their loved ones calling their name from the woods, they knew something was wrong. Maybe it was the pitch or the inflection of the voice. Whatever it was, it wasn't right and people can tell. These creatures try to mimic the form of their prey. We see them as ghouls or goblins. It's their attempt at mimicking a human. It's the best they can do. 
If they were better at their game, I imagine we would be in more trouble. I'm not sure what they would do to someone if they caught them, but I imagine it isn't good. Kind of makes you think that some of the people who go missing in the mountains might have run into one of the creatures. The only thing I can say for certain is, if you're out in the wilds and something feels off or not quite right, get out of there as fast as you can. I live in central Pennsylvania, dead smack in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. If hiking and nature are your things, then this place is a paradise. Otherwise, there isn't much at all going on. I spend a lot of time up in the mountains, as much as possible, really. I don't have a girlfriend or many friends, and my parents moved to Florida a few years ago. So all of my free time is spent hiking, exploring the ridges and trails. I considered myself to be somewhat of an expert on all the nearby hiking trails and thought that there was very little left more me to see and no more surprises to be had. I was dead wrong. On this particular day, I set off early in the morning. I usually only carried a little water and a light lunch. Even being as seasoned as I was, I didn't really want to get caught in the mountains on a cold January night. And so I had planned to be off the trail and back in my car before dark. I spent the first few hours walking one of my typical trails and even ran into a fellow hiker whom I saw often. We walked together for a bit until around noon when she said she had to start heading back. Continuing by myself and eating my sandwich on the go, I eventually came across a small trail leading off from the main one. This did surprise me a little bit. I had been on this trail dozens of times and had never seen this cut off before. It wasn't intentionally cleared. It looked more like a game trail, but definitely a bit wider than you'd expect a deer to make. Thinking what the hell and excited for a new experience, I cut right off the main trail and onto the cutoff. It was a pretty direct trail, almost a straight line with very few twists and turns. The one thing I noticed was the number of broken branches and twigs scattered across the forest floor. Looking up at the overhanging trees, I spotted a few places where branches had obviously broken off. Some were as high as eight feet off the ground. I didn't think too much of it. Maybe some kids had come up here acting goofy or something. I walked on for about another 20 minutes or so, eventually coming upon a stream running down from the mountain's top. I was intrigued by the stream. I had no idea where it came from and where it ended, so I followed it upstream a bit. Then I found it. I found a cave set back into the side of the mountain. The stream continued just past it and was only about 10 yards away. Caves aren't exactly common here in these parts of the mountains, and seeing this one made my heart leap with excitement. Of course, there was always the possibility that some kind of predator inhabited the cave. And if so, it was most likely a black bear. I decided that the chance to explore something new was just too good of a chance to pass up, so I started walking toward it. The first thing that hit me was the smell. It was rancid, like meat had been left out in the sun to spoil for a week. Mix that smell with damp fur and rotted wood, and you have an idea of the aroma I was experiencing. Alarm bells were going off in my head, but I headed in anyway. I used my phone flashlight when I got close and noticed something odd on the walls of the cave. Some kind of art, which reminded me of cave paintings made by early humans except that the figure in the rudimentary painting didn't look anything like a human. The figures were much taller and wider. They were almost twice the size of a normal human. I had no idea what kind of material was used. It was a splotchy red material. I followed the cave deeper. The further I went, the more intense the smell became. I put my sleeve over my nose and mouth, but it didn't do much to help. The cave curved to the right, and as I came around the bend, it widened considerably into a chamber. I was stunned by what I saw. Ornaments is the word that I guess would best describe them. And they were strung up all across the ceiling of the cave. Lengths of vine that were tied together with various animal bones hung down like sick party streamers. More bones were scattered across the floor. Against one of the walls of the cave stood a five-foot length of wood with a stone tip lashed to the end of it, like a primitive spear. 
Across the chamber, stretched out on what looked like a bed of leaves, lay a massive, thick-furred creature. I'm not sure how I missed it initially, but it looked like it was sleeping, its chest rising and falling rhythmically. This wasn't a bear, and I wasn't keen to find out what it was, so I began a slow backward retreat to the cave exit, eyes transfixed on the sleeping thing. I only made it a few steps before my head bumped into one of the hanging streams of bone. I barely had even nudged it, but sure enough, it fell to the floor with a clatter. The creature snapped straight upright, yellow eyes glaring in my direction. Without a second thought, I turned and bowled the way I had come. I heard a string of grunts behind me, accompanied by the clattering of the bone decorations. It was after me. I made it out of the cave into the sunlight, the sudden glare momentarily blinding me. Another threatening grunt was behind me, and I was snapped out of it and off running through the forest. I ran for what seemed like a mile, fortunately with no sign of sight of pursuit. I made it back to the trailhead where I parked my car, jumped in, and peeled out with no intention of ever coming back. And I haven't. The first time I saw them, I was just a kid. My imaginary friends is what my mother called them. How else would a parent explain the things I described? I used to play with them in the yard outside my house. They used to call to me from outside my window, luring me out in the night. When they were there, I didn't even need to open the pane. When they were there, I could pass through the glass like it was a layer of water. These things changed it in some way, I guess. Or maybe I was too enamored by another session with my so-called playmates to notice how they pried open the window without ever making a noise. Either way, those nights often unfolded in the same manner. We'd run around in the grass, easily navigating the dark in fits of giggles and chatter. Their voices sounded more like chirping, but they were easy enough for me to understand. One or two of them would always play with me. They would follow me closely and bend down whenever I found something interesting in the grass. Like a pretty stone or a flower or a toy I'd left outside, there were always more around but the rest of them only ever watched. They stood back a great distance blinking with their large black eyes. That should have creeped me out, I guess. But I was always having too much fun to think about the other ones. Aside from those strange black eyes and their pallid skin, they felt like kids. Just the same as me. They were my height and my shape, but gray in complexion. I wasn't worried about what they looked like. We always had fun, except for the nights we were caught. You've been caught by your parent before, right? Excitement drains from your veins and your heart pumps you full of guilt. I knew I didn't belong out there. Especially not after everyone had gone to bed. But how could I tell these friends no? I would have felt guilty for a different reason then. At least this way I got to play for a while. But my parents never caused together. They always found me alone. My friends were quick. They could hide exactly where they stood. Disappearing as if a blanket had been thrown over their heads imaginary. That's what everyone told me when I explained it all. At least that's what they said until they saw them. One night after my parents had grown particularly fed up with my antics, they decided to keep an especially close eye on me. They left the door open to my bedroom, which is something they never did. Surprisingly, what woke me that night was the sound of the door closing. I heard it slam shut. I thought I was in trouble already and my parents were upset. But when I turned toward my window, I saw the real culprit. One of my friends was there, looking in through the glass. They chirped at me, and I knew at once that they had closed the door somehow. They closed it the same way they brought me outside, in some magical way that I couldn't understand at the time. They wanted me to come outside again. This time, I hesitated. I don't know why. Maybe it was the way my friend slammed the door. It was the first time I'd ever felt anything like frustration coming from one of them. Maybe it was the way this particular friend felt a little different. The way it tilted its head when it invited me out felt more like a lure than a request. It felt like a trap this time. Like someone was getting ready to pull a prank on me. That was when my mother walked in. The door squeaked open behind me and I watched the creature's eyes go wide. I followed its stare back to the entrance of my room where I could see the light from the hall coloring my mother's silhouette. She was ghostly white. 
Her mouth was open, her eyes seemed distant. She was looking at my friend, but it was as if she was staring past them. It was as if she saw something bigger out there, something greater than anything I could understand. I didn't know if my friend looked different to her, or maybe she couldn't see them clearly in the light. I'm older now. I guess I know what she was feeling. Terrified. Then she screamed. It's the only time I've ever heard my mother truly scream. It was as if her bones were rattling and her heart was in her gut. My father showed up soon after that. He just appeared. I don't know where he was in the house, but he got there quickly. Basically instantly, he yanked my mother back and stepped inside to check on me. He was just in time to see my friend disappear. He must have only caught a glimpse because he blinked a few times and turned toward me. He opened his mouth but didn't say anything. That night, my parents quickly packed a few basics and we drove an hour and slept at my aunt's house. My parents changed their tune about my imaginary friends after that. They insisted that I stop playing with them and that I never engage with them at all. And so I did. And that's when the invites stopped coming. My late night adventures through the fields outside came to an end. I never forgot them though. I never mistook them for a dream. Neither did my parents. I caught them peeking into my room a few times with sweat on their foreheads and a tremble on their lips. Eventually that stopped too. My life went on as normal and I think eventually my parents were able to forget about my friends. They pushed it somewhere far back in their minds. At least that's what I tell myself because we never talk about them. But all these years later, I haven't forgotten. How could I forget? I told them I couldn't come outside, but that didn't stop my friends from visiting. They could be there without me seeing, remember? Like wearing a cloak of invisibility. And they could pass through my window without making a sound. Sometimes, even now, I hear their chirping and I know that they're still here with me. I'm Lana, a field biologist, and my specialty is the study of nocturnal animals. During one of my research trips in the Pacific Northwest, I came across something that I still have trouble believing. I was in a remote area studying the effects of light pollution on the local bat species. You know, the usual field work, but something was off that night. Even before the encounter, I could sense a shift in the air, a kind of dissonance in the night sounds. It was as if the creatures around me were aware of something that I was yet to perceive. There was a certain anticipation, a palpable tension that made the night feel heavier. In retrospect, it was as though the forest was preparing me for what was to come a prelude to the strange encounter that would soon unfold. The sounds I was used to the rustle of the wind in the trees, the chirp of crickets, they were all there. But there was an additional sound, a strange clicking noise, almost like an insect, but deeper, more resonant. This clicking noise, it wasn't just peculiar, it was disruptive. It seemed to slice through the fabric of the night. It had a strange cadence, rhythmical but not uniform, as if following some unknown language of clicks. The effect on the nearby fauna was noticeable. The chirping of the crickets seemed to lower in volume as if they were trying to hide. The bats I was studying appeared to be disoriented, and over time I noticed that their usual flight paths had become erratic and unpredictable. What's more, I noticed the absence of certain sounds, such as the skittering of nocturnal rodents and the occasional rustle of bushes indicating the movement of larger mammals. It was as if the regular inhabitants of the night had either gone silent or retreated, leaving the stage to this strange newcomer and its dissonant melody. After listening for a bit, I decided to follow the noise. My curiosity was piqued. It wasn't long before I saw it, off in front of me in the underbrush, Moving faster than any creature that size has any right to move was this pale, gaunt figure. It was around six feet long and was moving on all fours. Its face was almost human, but the eyes were all wrong. They were large and black and it had no nose. Its mouth was wide open like it was gasping for air. As I observed the creature, the first thing that struck me was its agility. For something that large and seemingly ill-suited for traveling on all fours, it moved perfectly. 
It navigated the underbrush with swift, precise movements. There was an odd rhythm to its movements, a sort of serpentine flow that seemed almost hypnotic. It moved both above and through the underbrush seemingly at the same time. Its gaunt body was flexible and swift. The creature seemed perfectly at home in its environment. It would stop occasionally, raising its head as if sniffing the air, then change its direction with purpose. All the while it made those strange clicking noises, the rhythm growing more frantic whenever it altered its course. The uncanny blend of human-like features and animalistic behavior was unsettling. It was a strange being that was out of place. And yet, in the moments I observed it, it was a master of its surroundings. It's strange, but I wasn't immediately afraid. More like shocked, I suppose. I deal with wildlife daily, but this was something else. Something beyond my understanding. So I backed away slowly, not wanting to provoke it. In those moments, my thoughts were a whirlwind. As a scientist, I was struck by the incredible discovery. This creature, whatever it was, could challenge our understanding of zoology and perhaps even anthropology. The scientific implications were staggering. At the same time, the primal part of me was acutely aware of the potential danger. I was alone in the wilderness with an unknown entity. This creature was fast, agile, and clearly not a typical inhabitant of these woods. I was in its territory and I didn't know how it would react to my presence. Eventually, survival instinct overpowered my scientific curiosity. I was in uncharted territory and the smart move was to back away slowly to avoid startling the creature. Despite the awe and the adrenaline rush, I knew I had to prioritize my safety. The forest at night is no place for risks, especially when you're face to face with the unknown. After that night, things in the forest were different. The local wildlife behavior totally shifted. It became more skittish, more aware of something being out there. In the weeks following the encounter, I continued my study, but the experience had left its mark. I found myself paying closer attention to the behavior of the local wildlife. The changes were subtle but noticeable. As for me, the memory of the encounter loomed large in my mind, affecting me more than I'd like to admit. My nights in the field were now filled with a sense of apprehension. Every rustle, every unknown sound sent my imagination racing. I tried to find the creature a few more times. Each time I was equipped with a camera, but the creature eluded me. I confided in a few of my peers about the encounter, and their reactions ranged from skepticism to intrigue. But in the end, without any physical evidence, it remained just an incredible story. Despite the unsettling experience, the encounter has given me a renewed sense of purpose. As a scientist, I feel it's now my job to unravel these secrets, even if it means coming face to face with the unfathomable, but that's a risk I'm willing to take. I was a park ranger for over 20 years. During that time, it never ceased to amaze me just how many people would tell me about encounters they had with the paranormal while visiting our public lands. I've also heard from other park rangers across the country. We do talk about these things if we're ever together. They shared their own stories of bizarre creatures that were disturbing and equally distressing. This made me wonder if this was happening everywhere. But I was always logical and scientifically minded, and so I mostly dismissed these sightings as crazy or else the product of imbalanced individuals. But there's always one story that has stuck with me, and that's because somebody died. And it was told to me directly by someone who was there. A father and his daughter were out for a walk in one of our national forests near a pond where ducks would congregate. The man later explained to me that as he was feeding the ducks with his daughter when he heard yelling in the trees, someone was screaming as if being attacked. He looked around frantically trying to identify who or what was causing the commotion, but saw nothing. He decided to run into the trees following the sound to see if he could help. Almost instantly, he came across a body. On the ground lay a man who had been savagely attacked and was covered in blood. It was a terrible sight and he was grateful he didn't bring his daughter into the woods with him. She had stayed back beside the pond forbidden to walk anywhere. The man said there was no sign of anyone, 
but he didn't really look much because all he could think of was his daughter back by the pond. As he ran back to her, he thinks he caught glimpses of creatures that were wolf-like. He said they were staying back but looking at him with crazy red eyes, and that they were deeper in the trees. He ran to his daughter, grabbed her, and ran to safety. He was deeply distressed and agitated when he told me the story, and to this day I haven't forgot it or the look on his face when he told it. It has stayed with me all these years because it was absolutely real. And the most upsetting part of it all being that somebody actually died at the hands of something deep in the woods, something unknown but dangerous and violent. I hope your listeners will believe me and take care of themselves when they are deep in the wilderness. This is not something to take lightly. Believe it from me. I don't want to make a big deal about this. I don't know if it's going to get me in trouble or what, but I've heard a similar story making the rounds on social media lately. I thought sharing my own encounter might lend some credibility to what those people are saying. I wasn't visited by something. I wasn't attacked by something. I wasn't chased or threatened or agitated in any way. But I did see the people who did experience those things. I was a young EMT on my third night shift with a new hospital. I was still a pretty quiet person then, following the instructions of the people who'd been in the job longer than me. We were responding to a 911 call. Due to a traffic incident on the way there, we were the last to arrive on scene. Police and fire had already secured the location. As we approached the house, I thought I saw something rising over the rooftop. It looked like a drone taking flight from the backyard. It was bigger than a drone, but wasn't much bigger than a motorcycle. I saw it, it flickered, and it was gone. It only lasted a second, and in that moment, there were other things on my mind. The home was a one-story building in the suburbs. The 911 operator had received a call from a child who said something had broken into their backyard. The child said their parents were out there with it, and they were screaming, fearing that an intruder had approached the home or that an animal had attacked the parents. The teams nearest to the area were dispatched. When we arrived, it seemed the incident was over. Fire directed us to the mother of the household, who had some pretty significant cuts on her arm. We asked if she was attacked. Between fits of tears and embarrassment, she said no. But she admitted that she'd caused it herself when she accidentally backed up through their glass patio door. There were scratches on her feet too. That was confusing enough. What had distracted her so badly that she didn't notice she was about to collide with her own door? We were starting to suspect that we'd walked into some kind of domestic incident. The father quickly dismissed that idea. He was being questioned by the police, but his answers were loud and frantic enough for all of us to hear. Fire stuck around just to keep listening. He said something crashed in their backyard. It shook the house and there was a flash of light and he knew that something had struck his property. Thinking a tree had fallen into the yard, he rushed to investigate. But he said it was a vehicle. He said he saw a tear-shaped vessel jutting out of the earth. As he spoke, we snuck a peek at the back. Sure enough, there was a point of impact in the otherwise impeccable lawn. That was enough evidence to hold everyone's attention. Normally, claims like that would be dismissed as the ravings of the mentally ill or the intoxicated. This felt different. Besides, I had also seen something. I kept that detail to myself. He went on to say that as he approached the craft, he realized it was empty. One of the panels was missing, like it had fallen off during the descent. Inside was something shaped like a chair. He touched it. That's how I knew he was braver than me. He said he touched the side of the vehicle and that it felt more like glass than metal. Then he saw the pilot. He said it yelled at him. That's how it drew his attention. His eyes snapped from the vehicle to the edge of his property. Out there, according to the story, a man about four feet tall was approaching. That's when his wife started screaming. The man, meanwhile, couldn't move. As the mysterious figure drew closer, he said he noticed that he was wearing a suit. A strange combination of a pilot's helmet and pulsating organic material. Maybe just an extension of the man's own body. His descriptions of the pilot didn't make much sense. He called him not a man, but sort of like a man. 
He detailed that pulsating material as a heart shaped like a hose, running from the pilot's mouth to his chest. Then the glass broke. That was enough to startle the husband out of his paralysis, I guess. He ran to check on his wife and soon enough the flashing lights were closing in around his home. He said they watched the pilot climb into his craft. The missing panel simply materialized above him, still reminiscent of glass. And then the fire department was at his door. By the time he gathered his wits and let them in, guiding them to the backyard, police and paramedics were also arriving. We were arriving and at the same time, the craft vanished. I knew better than that. I knew that the craft hadn't simply disappeared. It had taken off. I knew I could validate the guy's story then and there. I chose not to. I don't know if I was just too stunned or if I was too scared, but I didn't chime in. I let the rest of the emergency responders shake their heads and dismiss the guy's story. Even with a hole in his backyard, they weren't convinced that something otherworldly had happened. I wasn't ready to admit it either, and I'd seen the tear-shaped craft just like the father had. In the end, we all let this be one of our weird stories. We buried it. No one ever said anything. No one asked any questions even after that family fled the city in fear. But now similar stories are coming out, aren't they? Now I'm not the first one to stand up. It's easier with a group, I guess. These strange occurrences, the encounters you can't quite believe, I've seen them and they're absolutely real. Hi Donovan, I'm Eli. Just a regular 20 year old guy, but I have this constant itch for adventure. I'm not the type to sit still and that really got me into some trouble a few years ago. You'll understand why when I tell you about my backyard. I call it my playground. It's the Florida Everglades. It's not your typical backyard at all. Imagine something like a jungle but filled with tangled mangroves. They're gnarly roots digging into the dark, swampy earth. You look around and all you can see are endless miles of wetlands, broken here and there by spots of dry ground and shadowy trees. At night, the sky lights up with a ton of stars that shine down on the slow-moving water channels. This is where my story takes place. To understand why I was out there, you've got to understand more about me. I've always been that one friend who'd rather spend time being outside than playing video games. The one who'd stay up late reading about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster instead of comic books. My whole life has been near the Everglades, and ever since I was little, it's been calling out to me, whispering secrets in my ears. You see, the Everglades, it's not just a big swamp, it's a treasure chest of stories. Living so close, I'd always hear tales about it. Grown-ups in town talked about strange lights that appeared in the middle of the night. Spooky sounds echoing through the swamp that didn't belong to any animal we knew. And then there was the legend of the Everglades beast. Some folks said it was just a tall tale. Something that parents made up to keep their kids from wandering too deep into the swamp. But others... They swore it was real. They said it was this giant creature living deep within the Everglades. Every time someone told the story, it became scarier, more real, and the beast became something more than just a story to me. It became something I wanted to figure out. Maybe it sounds crazy, but those stories, they didn't scare me. Instead, they felt like a challenge. I wanted to know if there was any truth to these legends or if they were really just stories meant to scare kids. So I decided to find out for myself. That's why one summer night, I found myself gearing up for the deepest adventure into the Everglades I'd ever attempted. I made sure everyone was asleep before leaving the house. I then grabbed my pack that was packed and ready for me in my closet and headed out. It wasn't far, I could walk to where I wanted to enter in less than 30 minutes. As I trudged deeper into the dense mangroves with my flashlight, the noises of the night filled my ears. Crickets, frogs, the distant hoot of an owl. But then I stumbled upon something odd. There were these large footprints in the mud. Really big footprints. That freaked me out, but also made me feel that I was onto something and so I trudged onwards. But before long, I heard this low rumbling. It wasn't the familiar sound of gators or even panthers. The air felt heavier too, like how it feels right before a storm hits. 
I stood there a bit in quiet anticipation. I also felt my hands start to tingle. Then, there it was. Standing in a small opening partially shrouded by shadows was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. It towered above me almost as tall as the scraggly cypress trees around us, reaching a good eight feet high. The sight of it sent a jolt of surprise and fear up my spine. Its body stood awkwardly on two feet, its shoulders hunched over like it was always ready to pounce. It had an odd way of moving, almost clumsy, as if it wasn't used to walking upright. Its skin was a muddy green blending in with the swampy surroundings. But its head, oh boy, that was the most terrifying part. The head looked like it was borrowed straight from an alligator or a crocodile, complete with a broad snout and a mouth lined with razor-sharp teeth that glinted in the sparse moonlight. It was like someone had stuck an alligator's head on a giant's body, creating this monstrous mashup that defied everything I knew about the natural world. But its eyes, they were the worst part, two glowing yellow orbs that seemed to send out this eerie, almost dangerous light. They were intense and staring right at me. Even from a distance, I could see them clearly, could feel them boring into me like two laser beams. They were full of an evil that seemed as old as the Everglades themselves. All the stories I'd heard didn't come close to what I was seeing. The reality was far more frightening. I felt like I'd stumbled into a nightmare, and the worst part was I wasn't sure if I could wake up from it. The Beast of the Everglades wasn't just a story anymore. It was standing right in front of me. Fear gripped me. I wanted to run, scream, anything. But I was stuck in place by those two burning eyes. If I moved, I risked attracting its attention. If I didn't, who knows how long before it noticed me. Then slowly, as if moving through molasses, I began to inch backwards. Every crunch underfoot felt like a loud shout in the silence. But the creature didn't move. I kept moving backwards until I felt safe enough to turn around, and then I bolted, running faster than I ever had. By the time I got back to the edge of the swamp, my lungs were on fire my legs felt like jelly. But I didn't stop until I was back in my house, door locked behind me. I looked out the window towards the swamp, half expecting to see those yellow eyes staring back, but all was quiet. I never told anyone what I saw. I mean, who believed me? But since that night, I stopped my midnight adventures. The Everglades was no longer my playground, not when the sun went down. And I'm totally okay with that. It's a scary thing, being faced with death. We don't like to think about it because we know it'll happen to us and those we love. And it also poses the question of, what happens after? I never believed in ghosts before. I believed that when we died, we just died. There was nothing after. But I guess my views have changed quite a bit since this happened. At the time, I was working as a police officer, and we had been dispatched to a restaurant. It was a small Mexican restaurant. It was family owned. It was actually one of my favorite restaurants to eat at. On Saturday nights, they'd open the basement up so we could play some pool. It was a good time. In fact, many of the officers from my department would go after a late shift. So we were surprised when we were called to the establishment for a possible break-in. It was early in the morning. I'd say it was around 6.30 to 7 a.m. We were told that the owners had received a call from one of the cooks who had gone into prep for that day. They had stumbled upon some broken glass. Some of the tables had been knocked over and much of the place was in disarray. When we arrived, the owners were devastated. They believed that they had been targeted because of their ethnic background. Being that I was also Hispanic, I assured them that it didn't appear to be anything of that nature, but that I'd help get to the bottom of it. I could see why they believed that they were targeted. Much of their property had been vandalized, but nothing was taken. However, if it was indeed a situation involving race, they would have destroyed things like the sombreros that were hung up along the bar, or even graffitied the large mural at the front entrance. Nothing related to Hispanic culture had been harmed. Just a lot of broken chairs, upturned furniture, and things of that nature. It was really unusual. The destruction of the restaurant seemed to have been an act of anger. In this way, 
they did feel targeted. We had asked about the events that had transpired the night before. Had anyone been upset with their visit to the restaurant? Did they recently let someone go who may have been disgruntled? Was there a chance that someone had been locked inside the restaurant that night? To all of these questions, they answered no. All that we had to go on were some cue balls that had been left in some of the glass shards. It was very unusual. My guess was that someone threw the balls at the glass partitions, but I couldn't answer why. So I went down to the pool hall. It was in the basement of the restaurant, as I've mentioned. I took the stairs down. When I got down to the basement, it felt inexplicably cold. I know it's a basement and all, but it felt like I was walking into a meat locker. And the air felt very dense, thick. That's the best way I can describe it. I started looking around for any signs of vandalism. It was surprisingly well kept. Nothing seemed to be out of place. Even the billiard balls were in their place, with the exception of the couple that had been found upstairs. I started looking under tables and corners for a possible suspect that may have been hiding. Not a trace of anyone. But then I started smelling cigar smoke. It was very strong, like someone had been sitting in the pool hall for hours. And it just came out of nowhere. It made me feel sick, but it was so unusual. I really had no explanation for it. But I continued looking for any evidence that we could later use. It was weird. So in the billiard room, they had a couple of booths on the south side. And opposite of that was an old bar with some mirrors that were placed along the walls. So when you looked towards the bar counter, you were looking back at yourself. Of course, they didn't use the bar downstairs. I was told that they didn't have enough wait staff to manage the pool hall in the restaurant. So it was literally only used for pool. Anyways, I'm looking around and I keep seeing myself in the mirror, which was really causing me some trouble. I kept thinking I was seeing someone in the room with me, when really I was just seeing myself. It was really tripping me out, but I didn't find anything. So I went to turn back towards the stairs to head to the restaurant when I heard a clack. I turn and I see all of the billiard balls just spreading out on the pool table. So I'm like, oh hell no. There wasn't a draft. No one else was down there with me. How did these balls move? So I start looking around again. I'm really feeling like someone's watching me. Like they're in one of the booths and they're just eyeballing me. But again, there's no one there. I'm getting uncomfortable. So I start making my way towards the stairs and I just hear this awful sound. It sounded like glass shattering. So I turn again and I notice that one of the mirrored panels had shattered all over the bar. Of course, everyone upstairs hears it too, so they come running down. I told the owners what had happened. They said that they had been told of similar experiences, like the smell of cigars and feeling like someone else was in the room with you. One of the owners had confessed that in the early years of the restaurant, they had an incident where someone had taken their life at the facility. But I wasn't really sure it answered my questions. Was the vandal a ghost? That sounds ridiculous. But what other explanation do I have? I don't have one. Do I believe in ghosts now? Yes, I really do. Nothing ever came of vandalism. So tell me, what do you think happened? My name is Greg a humble man who relishes the serenity of the outdoors. You might find it hard to believe, but I recently encountered an event that rattled me deeply. I've always felt an innate connection to nature. My affection began during my childhood in the countryside, where my weekends consisted of exploring the nearby woods and persisted into my adulthood when I opted to be a park ranger to maintain proximity to the wilderness. The outdoors was my haven my peaceful retreat, and I was convinced that nothing within it could ever unsettle me. I used to tell my friends that I'd feel more comfortable stranded in a dense forest than in a crowded city. However, after an eerie encounter in the Appalachian Mountains, my perspective altered significantly. Nowadays, I scrutinize every rustling leaf or snapping twig, speculating if it might be the creature I saw. That ominous encounter has instilled in me a caution bordering on fear that I've never before associated with nature. On the occasion of this peculiar incident, 
I was hiking the secluded trails of the Appalachian Mountains. I selected the Appalachian Trail due to its reputation for diverse wildlife and peaceful solitude. As a ranger, I was confident in my survival skills and eagerly anticipated the isolation. I meticulously planned for the trip, cross-referencing maps and packing all the essentials, from a first aid kit to camping gear and enough food for a week. My intention was to immerse myself in the wilderness and separate myself from the world for a while, write in my journal and read my books. But as it turned out, the universe had different plans. Before my encounter, I perceived something was amiss. The silence of the forest wasn't the usual calm and quiet. It was unnerving, and the stench was horrifying, akin to the smell of rotting meat, strong enough to make me wretch. Upon arriving at my camping spot, an eerie silence gripped the area. You might expect a park ranger to be accustomed to silence in the wilderness, but this was different. I attributed the unusual quiet to a predator possibly lurking nearby, causing the wildlife to remain silent. I set up camp and prepared dinner, trying to overlook the growing unease within me. But as day transitioned into night, the quiet deepened, seeming almost palpable, as if it were encroaching upon my campsite. It was then I saw it. A silhouette barely distinguishable amid the dense woods stepped into a patch of moonlight. What I saw was a creature standing at least nine feet tall with deer-like legs and a skull-like face that evoked a skull I once found. Its eyes glowed a terrifying yellow. I was paralyzed with fear, unsure of how to respond. As the creature moved further into the light, all my senses heightened. My heart raced in my chest as every instinct implored me to flee, but my body felt frozen in place. I could now see the towering figure more clearly, its size precluding it from being any known animal in the region. The skull-like face featured antlers, and where its eyes should have been, there were only two hollow, dark pits. Time seemed to stretch endlessly as I observed the rest of its confusing features. Portions of its flesh appeared to be decomposing, exposing the skeletal structure underneath. This frightful sight, compounded by the putrid smell of decay that was now stronger than ever, amplified my panic. The surreal reality felt akin to a scene from a horror movie. After what seemed like an eternity, I gathered enough courage to slowly back away, my eyes never leaving it. I made it back to my camp and departed at dawn's first light. However, the memory of that encounter has left an indelible mark on my mind. The forest doesn't feel the same anymore. That night in the camp was one of the longest I've ever endured. Every sound, every rustle of leaves stirred by the wind was amplified, fueling my paranoia. I imagined the creature lurking in the shadows, watching. The arrival of dawn couldn't have come soon enough. As soon as the first rays of sunlight pierced through the trees, I hurriedly packed up my gear leaving behind a few non-essential items in my haste to distance myself from that place as much as possible. This encounter has profoundly impacted my life. The wilderness no longer resonates with the same sense of freedom and tranquility for me. It's akin to a dark cloud that looms over every hiking or camping excursion. I often find myself looking over my shoulder half expecting to see that creature again. Yet despite the fear, I continue to journey into the wilderness, albeit with a renewed respect and the realization that we are not always the apex predators. I don't trust people that don't believe in the paranormal. How can you say spirits don't exist? It makes no sense to me. How can you be sure something you can't see isn't there? People will just say aliens don't exist. The Earth is one tiny speck in an infinitely expanding universe. What kind of person is 100% sure that there isn't life anywhere else but on Earth? Blows my mind. Anyways, I know you read paranormal experiences on your channel, so I'll tell you about something that happened to me back when I was a park ranger. We had gotten all kinds of reports from campers and hikers of screams in this one section of the forest. People hear crazy things in the forest all the time but we received over 40 accounts of hearing screams near this campsite. 
My partner and I grabbed our gear, got in the truck, and headed down the road. We decided to camp out there for the night, so we wouldn't miss anything. We started a fire, set up a couple of tents, brought some food, and we were in good shape. Even if we didn't get to the source of the notorious screaming, we were prepared to have a great night out camping. We grilled some steaks and sat around for a while, enjoying the peace. Then we heard a terrible scream coming from deep in the forest. We radioed in that we heard the scream and were going into the woods to investigate. We grabbed our flashlights and started making our way towards the scream. There wasn't much noise after that. We just took our time and slowly made our way deeper into the woods. The forest was weirdly quiet and it felt like something was wrong. We both stopped walking and just stood in the middle of the forest to see if we could hear anything. Suddenly, we heard a scream so loud that it hurt both of our ears. It wasn't like anything I ever heard before. It was human-like, but much more bellowing and with more of a growl to it. I looked to my left and I saw the most terrifying creature I've ever seen in my life. It was freakishly tall, standing on its hind legs and about seven feet tall. It had glowing blue eyes and looked like a wolf, but much larger and more muscular. Its face was menacing, like a cross between a wolf, an ape, and a demon. It charged right at me, and I dove out of the way to avoid being trampled to death. I heard gunshots, and when I looked, I saw my partner fire several rounds into the creature. It swung at my partner, and he jumped out of the way inches from being butchered. I shot it in the back of the head, and it whipped around, looked me right in the eyes, and howled at me. I ran away as fast as I could towards the campsite and heard my partner screaming behind me. I couldn't just leave him back there to get mauled, so I took off towards his cries. When I met back up with him, he was halfway up a tree and he pointed in the direction the creature ran off in. We both started running out of the forest and we heard the creature scream once again. It was still very much alive. We gathered up everything from the campsite, shoved it in the van and got the hell out of there. When we were filing the report, we got a visit from a man in a suit from the U.S. Department of the Interior. When we told him what happened, he repeated the story back to us, but insisted that we report it as a rabid bear. We explained to him that it wasn't a bear. Its eyes glowed and it looked like a wolf and ape mix. We told him it was over seven feet tall and it screamed like a human. He simply nodded and then after a pause, he insisted again that the encounter we had was with a rabid bear. He also congratulated us on successfully killing the creature. I explained to him that we didn't kill it and it was still running wild in the forest. He then got very stern with me and said that if I valued my job, freedom, and life, I would put that we killed the rabid bear, causing all the issues. It was a disturbing moment. He ripped up the initial report and said that he looked forward to reading about what happened to us in the forest. Then he left. I was terrified and pissed off. There was something seriously dangerous in our backyard, and the government wouldn't let us get the help we need to get rid of it. It made me question all the information I've ever received in my entire life. If they're powerful enough to make the victims of a paranormal creature lie about what they saw, then what else were they capable of? They're in charge of our schools. What are they brainwashing children to believe? They censor information on the internet. What don't they want us to know? I lied on the report and so did my partner. Under threat of losing my job, being thrown in jail, and even being killed, we were forced to lie about the most traumatic moment of our lives. I quit shortly afterward and I won't go near a government job ever again. If that happened to me, how many innocent people are out there getting bullied by the government? Is the government responsible for releasing a creature like that into the wild? I ask myself questions that keep me up at night and I wish this never happened to me. But it did happen to me and I am forever changed as a result. What do you think it was Donovan? Any insight would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for sharing the stories that the governing forces out there don't want us to know. I'm a trucker by trade. I've been driving big rigs all across the U.S. for nearly 20 years now. My story is not about your usual sighting on the highways, though. It's something different, something I can't explain. 
I was on a run from Nevada to New Mexico, hauling a load of construction supplies. My path took me through a long, lonely stretch of desert where the only company you have is the radio and the stars. About halfway into the route, it was already late. The only light came from my truck's headlights and the faint shimmer of the stars above. I decided to stop for a bit, stretch my legs, and get some fresh air. Now I've been on the road long enough to pick up on when something's off. That night, there was this unsettling quiet. Not your usual desert silence, but a heavy absolute hush that sends shivers down your spine. Then I noticed this awful smell, like rotten meat and burnt hair, real strong. I can still remember it. Out of nowhere, I saw this figure standing about a hundred yards from my rig, staring right at me. This creature was tall, between six and ten feet, I'd reckon, and its eyes. Damn. Those eyes were yellow, like two pieces of glass catching the light of a harvest moon. Now, I've seen a lot of things on the road, but I've never seen anything like this. This creature looked like it came straight out of a Jurassic Park movie, half human, half dinosaur, standing upright like a man, but with a head more like a lizard's. I could see the outline of big, black claws in my headlights. I won't lie, I was scared. This thing gave off a vibe that I will describe as pure evil. My heart was pounding so hard I swear I could hear it in my ears. But I couldn't look away from those damn eyes. Then, as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. One moment it was there, the next it just vanished, as if swallowed by the night. I was left there heart racing with only the silent desert as a witness. Once I felt sure the creature had disappeared, I took several deep breaths trying to steady my trembling hands. The desert had returned to its usual state, a desolate expanse bathed in moonlight. But I could still feel a lingering sense of unease, like the echo of a scream in an empty house. I decided I couldn't stay out there any longer. Clambering back into the cab of my truck, I started up the engine. Its usual comforting rumble now felt like a lifeline to reality a soothing counterpoint to the uncanny silence that had descended moments before. As I resumed my journey, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the creature's yellow eyes or its towering silhouette in the distance. The high beam from my headlight seemed feeble in the vast darkness of the desert, providing scant reassurance against the terror that had taken hold of me. For the rest of that run, I was on high alert, Senses heightened to any unusual sound or movement in the desolate landscape. Every shadow seemed menacing, every wind-blown tumbleweed a potential threat. It felt like the longest drive of my life. After that encounter, my perspective on those late-night runs changed. The solitude of the open road, once a source of peace, now felt ominous. I started avoiding that route, opting for busier highways whenever I could. Every time I got behind the wheel, I found myself fighting the memory of that night and the terror I felt. Even now, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night, heart pounding, the image of that creature and its piercing yellow eyes burnt into my mind. I've spent countless hours trying to make sense of it, questioning if it was real or just a product of my tired mind. I'm a park ranger stationed at Yellowstone National Park. I moved out here about six years ago from Seattle looking for a change of pace. The nature, the peace, it's all fantastic. But something happened a few days ago that's got me questioning the tranquility of my job. I was out late one night checking for any signs of wildfires, a typical part of my duties. That night, the dry wind was stronger than usual, an unfortunate sign of potential wildfire activity. I'd taken the ATV out for a more extensive coverage of the area. There had been a lightning storm earlier in the day, and I needed to ensure that no rogue strikes had started a fire. I had reached the northern boundary of my patrol route, a place dense with pines and rarely visited by park goers, when I first picked up on that disturbing scent. As I was making my rounds, I noticed an unusual scent in the air. I'm used to the smell of damp earth, pine needles, and wildlife. But this was different. It was pungent with an acrid undertone that reminded me of burnt matches or sulfur. 
It was then I heard a noise, not your standard nighttime rustlings or distant wolf howls. It was a guttural growl. My first reaction was to radio in some kind of animal disturbance, but as I fumbled from my walkie-talkie, a low growl rippled through the air, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand. It was a sound that seemed to vibrate in my very bones, almost as if the creature was more beast than the natural world could contain. I instinctively held my breath, my hand tightening around the flashlight. The rustle of the leaves around me seemed to cease, as if the very forest was holding its breath in anticipation. I turned my flashlight towards the sound and froze. There, standing on human-like legs, was this creature? It was massive, easily over eight feet tall, with a large chest and wide shoulders. Its back was humped in a way that reminded me of a hyena or some type of canine. Its fur was an unsettling mixture of black, brown, and patches of gray. The creature's face was truly chilling. It had a long snout filled with a double row of sharp, menacing teeth. The fangs were clear as my light reflected off them. Its ears were pointed, and the eyes, they were filled with an intelligent but terrifyingly demonic expression. The beam of my flashlight played over its monstrous form, the light seeming to be swallowed by the dark hues of its fur. Its eyes, glinting in the light, held a predatory intelligence that sent shivers down my spine. I could see the muscles under its fur ripple as it moved, a horrifying display of raw power. Its long snout twitched, the double row of teeth glistening wetly as if it had recently eaten, and those eyes... They seemed to look right through me, as though it was calculating, deciding what to do with this sudden interruption of its night. The encounter was like a fever dream. My blood ran cold, and every instinct told me to flee, but I was paralyzed with fear. The creature maintained its low growl, and for a few tense moments we just stared at each other. The fear traveling through me was unlike anything I've ever felt. You hear about fight or flight instincts. But in this moment, I was paralyzed by the sight of this creature. My mind was racing to comprehend what I was witnessing, trying to reconcile the reality before me with my understanding of the natural world. The creature didn't move, maintaining its growl. We were locked in a terrifying stalemate, the hunter and the hunted assessing each other in a silent confrontation. Suddenly, it reared up on its hind legs, let out a howl that echoed through the trees, and then bolted into the darkness. I stood there still in shock until the creature's house faded and the oppressive smell lessened. Once I snapped back to my senses, I quickly made my way back to my vehicle, feeling a mixture of fear and relief. Back at the station, I locked all the doors and spent the night jumping at every sound. As I sat in my locked vehicle, I couldn't help replaying the encounter over and over in my mind. Each growl, the terrifying visage of the creature, its intense eyes all felt etched into my memory. I spent the night in restless anticipation, jumping at every small sound outside, my eyes straining to penetrate the darkness outside the windows. The adrenaline wouldn't leave my system, leaving me in a state of heightened anxiety that made every shadow a potential threat. I felt a raw vulnerability, a realization that there were things out there in the night, things we aren't prepared to face. The next day, I went back to the location trying to convince myself that it was just a bear, a trick of the light. But the sulfuric smell still lingered and there were tracks unlike any I've seen before. That's when I realized I couldn't explain this away. It wasn't a bear or any other animal I'm familiar with. This was something different, something not of our usual understanding of wildlife. I haven't told my colleagues about this yet. I'm still trying to make sense of it all. Thought you might be interested in my encounter, given the nature of your show. Let me know if you'd like more details. I've got the whole encounter burned into my memory. The house I grew up in was very haunted. I know everyone always thinks, why didn't your family just move out? But it's not as easy as that. My mother inherited the house from her father when he passed away. It was completely paid off, so all we had to pay were the property taxes. We were very middle class. So moving away and into a new house wasn't really an option. 
There were a few unspoken rules in the house. Probably the most important of them was never go to the basement alone. The basement was old and musty. There was only one small light installed and the floors were still dirt. The only reason anyone really needed to go down there was for laundry. Even then, you never went alone. There was constant strange activity in the house. Items would go missing and turn up in strange places. And hearing weird noises at night was normal. My parents tried to cover it up by making up some outlandish explanation. But I always knew the truth. It was manageable most of the time. We could all just ignore it and move on with our life. One day, I had just gotten home from school and both of my parents were at work. I had been in the living room watching some cartoon and I thought I heard meowing. I muted the TV and walked around the house looking for the source. I stood next to the basement door and realized the sound had been coming from there. Really, that was no surprise. I hesitated for a moment. I didn't want to go down alone, but I also wanted to see the cat. My childish desire to see the cat took over and I started walking down the stairs. The meowing got louder as I walked down and I started trying to call it over to me. I made it to the bottom of the steps and I looked around. It hit me when I got down there that I didn't know how a cat would gotten in there anyway. There were no windows or doors for it to have snuck in from, but I was too young to have thought that through in advance. I didn't hear the meowing anymore as I stood at the bottom of the stairs. So now I was creeped out and wanted to go back upstairs and ignore this noise. Just like we did with everything else that happened. Then I heard a laugh and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I wasn't alone down there. I ran up the stairs and slammed the door behind me. I sat down on the couch and unmuted the TV. I remember panting and hyperventilating because I was so scared, but this was how we dealt with them. We just pretended they weren't there. When my parents came home, I told them what happened. My mother was upset with me for going down there alone, especially when no one else was home. She made me promise never to do it again. About a week or two later, I was home alone again and doing homework on the dining room table. I heard a gently tapping sound on the basement door and my head perked up. It sounded like something was calling to me, like it wanted me to let it out of the basement. I ignored it and went up to my room so I couldn't hear it. Later that night, I'd had bad dream. I woke up and walked to the kitchen to get a drink of water. While I was in the kitchen, I heard a soft creaking noise and turned around to see the basement door ajar. My heart sunk when I saw it. I didn't want to walk past it to go back to my room either, but I had to. I walked past it and pushed it shut as I walked by. But before I could walk away fully, I heard the doorknob jingling. I could see it being turned back and forth forcefully. I jumped when a banging noise came from behind it. I could see the door frame shaking from the force of it. I ran back to my room and hid under the covers of my bed. Nothing happened that I was aware of for the rest of the night, and somehow I fell asleep shortly after getting in bed. The next morning, my mother yelled at me about leaving the basement door open and how I promised I wouldn't go down there. I tried to explain what happened, but she thought I wasn't telling the whole story. She thought I was leaving the part out where I opened the door. After that, the strange activity got much worse. I heard laughing in the hallway while I was trying to sleep. Light banging in the walls, things moved around a lot more. I found toys and bears broken. It was like something wanted me to let it out of the basement, and I must have. Whatever it was seemed to be fixated on me. I was the one hearing things, and it was my stuff that was missing. Something about its attachment to me felt abnormal. My mother had grown up there and never mentioned anything about it clinging to her. I finally saw the source of all of this one day. It was the middle of the night and I had to use the bathroom. I ran to go as fast as I could. I finished and washed my hands quickly and started back to my room. The hall light was off so I couldn't see it in great detail. But I saw a figure. A girl. She was young. Probably around 10 years old. She looked at me and walked out of the hall to the living room. It looked like she wanted me to follow her, but that was the last thing I wanted to do. I ran into my parents' room and woke them up. My dad walked out and checked on it. The basement door was open, but there wasn't any other sign of her. I keep wondering if she was lonely and just wanted to be my friend.
As a park ranger, there's nothing I fear more than a forest fire. It's dangerous and it's hard to contain. Fire can wipe out an entire ecosystem. Fire can erase history. The tallest trees in the world grow in California, more than 350 feet tall. Those trees can be burned just as easily as any other. 2,000 years of history can turn to ash in the blink of an eye. That's why protecting these trees is so important. That's why I started working as a park ranger in the first place, to protect history. Writing citations and filling out paperwork was never enough for me. I wanted to know that I was making a difference. A few years ago, I got that chance. The right combination of heat and lightning set fire to the thorns and the bushes tangled at the bottoms of the redwood trees. The dense landscape, often too tangled in roots to navigate, became the perfect fuel for the fire. It spread so quickly that the park rangers and firefighters were forced away from the burning forest. We had to focus our attention on the areas closest to homes and cities. By the time we secured the perimeter and saved those civilized areas, a large chunk of the redwoods was ablaze. History was burning down all around us. My unit was stationed on a highway. Our job was to keep the fire from getting too close to the road. If it crossed the pavement, the residential neighborhoods would be in danger all over again. Nothing's louder than a forest fire. It was hard for us to keep our focus above the cracking of the trees, the rumbling of the engines, and the whirring of the helicopter blades overhead. We did our best. We did our jobs. We held that fire in its tracks. Our little triumph and the difference I made that day aren't the reasons I'm writing, however. History is. That night, I learned that the trees weren't the only old things alive in that forest. It's normal to see wildlife running for their lives. Rodents, deer, and even the occasional bear will come sprinting out of the foliage and onto the road. A few of us were tasked with helping them to safety. We needed to keep them out of the way of the firemen. Eventually, I was asked to help with the wranglers. More animals than I'd ever seen came pouring from between the trees. All covered in ash and burns. I'd never seen anything like it. A lot of those animals, I'm sure, died not long after. There were too many injuries. There was too much smoke. We did what we could anyway. We cleaned them off and gave them water. We sent the lively ones on their way and helped animal control with the others. We had our own horrible little zoo before long. Soon there were so many animals around us that we couldn't help but notice their wounds. Not all of them burned. Some of them were cut. Deep lacerations, always three or four running parallel to one another. It looked like the animals had run through a rake or a rack of knives. The first few times we dismissed the wounds as bear attacks. Then we saw the same lacerations on the bears themselves. No signs of fight. As far as we could tell, the bears were only running. They were ambushed by something as they tried to escape the fires. Around the time that we accepted that, we started hearing them whooping and chattering from somewhere behind the cracking trees. The forest makes strange sounds when it's in danger. We tried to ignore them. Then they got louder. The other animals thinned out. The creatures were screaming like frenzied chimps, howling and barking as they drew nearer to the road. We could hear them banging branches on the husks of the trees. We wondered if they were trying to scare us off, push us back clear a path across the highway that wasn't obscured by emergency personnel. We didn't know for sure. We didn't budge. A few of the rangers said they saw creatures in the trees. They were describing apes the size of grizzlies. I don't need to tell you that nothing like that lives in that area. Nothing we know of anyway. Suddenly, large stones started crashing into our vehicles. Windshields shattered and doors caved in. We ran to take cover, crouching behind our cars. Once we were all in hiding, they came out. They ran like a stampede across the highway. They leaped from the rooftops of our vehicles and sailed over our heads. The light from the fire illuminated their bodies. The ash and the fur made the details hard to make out. More than a dozen of these beasts must have run across the road. I think we were all too shocked to keep count. We only realized that the running had stopped a few moments after the creatures had disappeared. We peeked out from our hiding spots one at a time, surveyed the damage. The steel and glass were battered. 
The animals were gone, taking cover somewhere on the safe side of the road. We looked between the faces of the rangers and the firefighters. None of us had any answers. We didn't have a choice but to get back to work. The fire was still there after all, still working to destroy the ecosystem that we were sworn to protect. We held the highway for four hours before we were allowed to change positions. None of us talked about the creatures we'd seen. I don't know if we were in disbelief or if we all figured that the animals had been through enough. They were scared and dangerous. Sending men after them would have brought on more trouble. We're far enough away from the fire now that I want some answers. I've come to accept that that night might have been the most important night of my life. I want to know how much of a difference I really made. The story I'm writing in to tell you about is completely based on dumb luck. Specifically, my dumb luck because I never should have been where I was in the first place. Since then, I've been laying low, and you'll see why. I'm taking a chance by telling you this, and I wouldn't be surprised if I received a message shortly after you put it out there. Or worse yet, a threat. About five years ago, I found myself working in a corporate office in the middle of nowhere. I'm not going to mention specifically what state it was in, because details will make it obvious to those who knew me that I'm the one they need to be looking out for. When I was in my early 20s, I took a job as a prison officer. It was a position lower on the totem pole, but pretty intense. Every day, there was a possibility of being seriously harmed by the inmates. It was hard to know which of them you could trust when, in reality, you really shouldn't trust any of them. After two years working this job, my girlfriend at the time started being vocal about how concerned she was for my health. I was sleeping poorly, stressed out all the time, and getting sick often because I was so run down. I'm sure being with someone who was around dangerous people all day also created stress too, so eventually I agreed to start looking for other work. After about six months of job searching, I got lucky and landed an interview with a security company. It was sort of local, about a 45 minute drive from where we lived in a major city. To paint a picture, this city was in the US and known for being hot and dry. There's not a ton of vegetation, but there's a lot of red rock. It's truly beautiful if you can appreciate that kind of landscape. I went through the interview process, which was intense but made sense for a security job. I was able to skip a few things because I was coming from the Department of Corrections. Basically, they had my prints on file but had to do an extensive background check. I had to be up to date on all immunizations and trained to handle extreme situations. But I got the impression from the interview that this job would be pretty chill. It was mostly sitting at a desk all day and checking people in. The first red flag should have been that the pay was so high. Obviously, I was happy to take it. For a few weeks, I relaxed before my start date, and then I made the drive to what would become a very memorable building. The building was a high rise of 15 floors. It was in a small compound and nothing else was nearby. The building wasn't technically in a town at all. The compound had concrete walls around it, and you had to swipe your badge at a gate. This was weird, but not totally uncommon. A lot of tech companies use this kind of security too. Around the compound, outside of the main building, were a few cafeterias, a gym for employees, the admin building, and a tiny medical building. It was a pretty nice setup. The first couple of months were quiet, and I was right. It was pretty much a desk job. I had no idea what the employees did, but most were dressed in suits or business casual. Their regular day ranged from 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. There was an overnight shift for security of two people on at a time, but I'd been hired for day shifts. That changed when one of my coworkers, who I'd come to like, had a family emergency and asked me to fill in for him. I figured that the 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift wouldn't kill me, and so I accepted. The night shifts actually made more money, so this was a good opportunity to try it out and see if I could make it work for a little extra money. I worked a shift on a Thursday night with Benji, another guard who was on the younger side. He was very vocal about the fact that his uncle worked here too and that's how he'd gotten hired. Nice kid, but a little too prideful. I tried to chat with him as we hung out at the desk and found out that he didn't actually know what his uncle did there. Weird, but whatever. At around one, I'm a woman rushed into the building. 
After hours, employees have to badge in. I hadn't heard her badge in and she was wearing denim overalls and a t-shirt. That put me on alert, but she had an employee badge that she showed me quickly and explained that she needed to pick something up on the 11th floor. I had her sign in, which she didn't seem eager to do, and decided that I would accompany her to the 11th floor because something seemed fishy about how she was acting. After telling Benji that I'd be right back, I got into the elevator with the woman and we rode up. She told me I could wait in the hallway, but she seemed nervous. So once she strode through a set of doors she had to badge into, I followed. These doors were opaque and I'd never been to this floor before. Because I was getting the sense that something wasn't right. I caught the door with my foot and looked in after her. The entire room was filled with tanks. I mean filled, human-sized tanks too. And in them wasn't water. It was some kind of purple translucent stuff. I could hear the woman rummaging around and knocking over things that sounded metal. After a few moments before I could get a good look at what was in the tanks, she rushed out with something carried tight to her chest. As soon as she saw me, she told me to get back to the elevator. I could hear sounds coming from the room but didn't know what was happening. There was a kind of groaning sound. We got into the elevator and I asked her what she'd taken, trying to get it from her, but she managed to wrestle it away from me and elbow me in the nose. My nose was bleeding badly and I couldn't see, so as soon as the elevator doors opened, she ran. I shouted for Benji to catch her, but he had his feet kicked up on the desk. He scrambled up, but she was already gone. As I cleaned myself up at the desk, I called our supervisor, who was always on call, and explained what had happened. B was quiet for a moment and then told me to stay there. Within 15 minutes, what looked like a SWAT team showed up with a few other people I recognized as employees. The employees hurried to the 11th floor as the SWAT team searched the grounds. I had to give a statement but never found out what the woman had taken or what had been in the room. I just happened to leave out that I'd gotten a glimpse in there and honestly, that probably saved my life. The week after I was fired, they phrased it as a layoff due to overstaffing, but I knew it had something to do with that night. I dug around for a while trying to learn more about the building and was able to trace the company back to the US government, but got no further because someone called me and told me to stop looking. That's it, no more explanation. And I listened, because whatever they had going on, there was dangerous, more dangerous than the prison. I've moved around a few times since then and keep a low profile. I'm now working as an insurance agent. Hopefully I've given little enough info that the people who know about me won't come looking, but I just wanted to get this story out there. It's both a warning and a message to let others know that if they witness something they shouldn't, they need to keep quiet. So, this is a story that I've kept to myself for the most part. Really, only a few close family members have ever heard it. My father told it to me, and the way he told it, his hands would shake and his eyes would seem to see through time and space. This ain't your typical creature encounter story, I warn you. It was back in 68, deep in the jungles of Vietnam. My old man was a soldier, a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed private shipped off from our small Kentucky ranch to that humid hell, half a world away. He was with the 101st Airborne Division, stationed at this forward outpost that was more of a mud pit with tents than an actual base. Now, Dad was a dutiful man, never one to shirk responsibility, and he took to military life as best he could. What he didn't much care for was being so far away from home. I think he missed the green fields and the clear creeks of Kentucky. Sure, Vietnam was different, you know, one teeming with danger, real and present. Anyway, before the whole shit show, the day had been relatively calm. The guys were doing what they usually did, smoking, cleaning their weapons or playing cards. Dad and his buddies, Hank and John, were having a break, huddled around a wooden crate they used as a makeshift table. All seasoned soldiers, they were slapping down cards and swapping stories from home. Hank was from Wisconsin, a dairy farmer's kid. John was from New York, son of a dock worker, city boy through and through. They were all different, but they became brothers in that wet jungle. They laughed, they fought, 
They bled together. That was the basic rhythm of their existence before. Before the incident, just regular GIs trying to keep sane in the chaos of war. Speaking of war, the combat ops were brutal too. They'd patrol during the day, maneuver through the foliage, crossing narrow streams and hike up steep inclines, all while watching out for the enemy. But their most dreaded part was the night ops. No one liked the jungle at night, Dad always emphasized. It was too quiet, too alive, too unforgiving. And then came the night that changed everything. It was one of those nights when the air felt heavy and there was an almost eerie stillness in the atmosphere. There were a couple of platoons tasked with venturing out for a standard recon. Dad and his close-knit group were among them. Their objective was to move in deeper into the woods, monitor the enemy movement, and return to the outpost by sunrise. With night vision lenses over their eyes, M16S gripped tight. They headed out. Each step they took deeper into the jungle, bathing them in a deeper layer of obsidian black and an oppressive silence. It was as if the jungle was holding its breath, waiting for some unseen shoe to drop. Even the insects had quieted down, creating an unnatural vacuum of sound. They moved cautiously, the darkness almost a physical barrier, the oppressive humidity sticking their clothes to their bodies. Despite the best efforts, a sense of unease had started to creep in. It was like they were being watched, but by what, they couldn't tell. There was just this prickle on the back of their necks, a cold sensation worming its way down their spines, and no one could shake off the impending sense of doom. As they moved further into the belly of the jungle, the air seemed to get denser, and the familiar natural sounds of nighttime were missing. It was like everything else living had just decided to turn tail and hide. The only sound they heard was their labored breaths, the squelching of their boots sinking into the mud, and the occasional unexplained rustle of leaves. And then, without warning, it happened. Something moved in the darkness, a sudden flash of movement registered in the corner of their eyes, followed by an ear-piercing, bone-rattling roar echoing around them. The menacing roar shook them to their bones, and their breath hitched in their throats. Fear is a potent thing, and right then, it injected its icy venom straight into their hearts. Without a word, they turned towards the source of the sound. My dad's hand tightened around the butt of his M16. His heart pounded against his ribcage, but he swallowed back the lump of dread clutching at his throat. Now my dad, he'd seen a lot in the NOM. He'd looked into the eyes of a man he'd just shot dead. He'd held his buddy as he bled out chanting half-forgotten prayers. He'd seen things that had hardened him to the harsh realities of life and death. But nothing, absolutely nothing, could have prepared him for what he saw next. Out of the blackness, something emerged. It towered above them, standing at least eight feet tall, with a bulk that screamed of raw, primal power. Its reptilian skin, smooth and scaly, glinted in the ambient low light shadowy and terrifyingly real. It was nothing like they had ever seen. A feature that made it stand out was its eyes piercing yellow, glowing menacingly in the dark like sinister beacons. Its massive clawed hands flexed menacingly, scraping the trunks of the trees, the sound grating and chilling. It moved with a strange agility that belied its massive size, circling them as if sizing them up. My dad said its gaze felt calculating like a predator contemplating its prey. The men were frozen as the creature observed the. Its predatory gaze sent a wave of visceral fear through them. The world plunged into a deadly game of predator and prey. All my dad and the others could do was hope and pray. And then it struck, fast, savage. Four men went down before they could even aim their rifles at it. It was like trying to fight shadows. Their bullets just whistled through the darkness completely missing the creature. The jungle erupted into a cacophony of gunfire and guttural roars as they fell back, leaving their fallen soldiers behind. They ran for what seemed like hours, stumbling through the underbrush until they reached their outpost. The men who went out jovial and confident came back haunted and broken. They had entered the jungle as soldiers, but they returned as survivors. They didn't talk about it, not then. What could they say? 
they'd encountered something that defied all logic, all understanding. The incident was written off as an ambush, and they were commended for getting as many men back alive. But they all bore the scar of that night. Dad told me he spent many nights afterward, staring into the darkness, the echoes of his past haunting him. He wondered about what they had encountered that night, wondered about the men they'd left behind. With tangible pain in his eyes, he told me that what they saw that night was pure evil. It was cunning, ruthless, and utterly remorseful. It was the embodiment of the chaotic and cutthroat symphony of the jungle at night. He didn't talk about this for a long time. He hated remembering the death, the fear. It took him a while to even admit to himself what they'd seen that night. He never found out what it was, tried to forget. But you can't really forget something like that, can you? It stays with you, a shadow cast over your life, always just out of sight, always remembered. And that's my old man's story, a wild tale of a soldier's encounter with the unknown and the painful scars it left. I forget a lot of things, small things mostly. The big things, the really important things, I never forget. I remember the shoes my wife was wearing on our first date. I remember the name of the doctor who delivered our child. I remember those things. For the most part, they're all good. They're all happy memories. I guess that speaks to the quality of my life, huh? I shouldn't complain and normally I don't. There is one memory though, from a time before all that happiness, that I've never been able to shake. I'd forget it if I could, but it's important so... We don't really get to decide which memories we keep, do we? I was camping in the backyard of my grandparents' property. They owned a few acres just outside of town, and turning all that land into my personal getaway was a highlight of my teen years. I'd fish at their little pond. I'd invite a few friends if I was in the partying mood. On this particular night, I was alone. I was stargazing. Out there, away from the city lights, looking up at the night sky. That's as close to peace as you can get. I knew it even back then. I drifted asleep on the blanket I'd rolled out. That often happened. I'd wake up with a few bug bites, but I was never worse for wear. This time I woke up early. I didn't open my eyes to the light of the dawn. I didn't roll over into a face full of morning dew. It couldn't have been later than 3 a.m. Something was howling. I grabbed my flashlight and cut the beam across the land. My free hand was already shakily searching for the pepper spray that I knew was somewhere close. I always kept it nearby, even if my grandparents never had issues with bears or coyotes. But my light didn't land on a coyote. It landed on the naked back of a man. He was emaciated. I could count the ridges on his spine. He was facing away from me at first, hunched over something that he tore at with his hands. I didn't say a word. How could I? What I was seeing was worse than any wild animal. Animals had behavior patterns. You could predict things about them. Men, especially men looking like the one I saw, were unpredictable. But then I saw him change. I saw him change and I couldn't stop myself from screaming. At first it looked like his spine was wriggling underneath his skin. It jerked and curled and pushed up against his flesh. His shoulders hunched and his hands slapped the ground. Then the fur started sprouting. It was like watching the time lapse of a growing seed. The dark strands poked up from his skin and grew into a thick forest. When my screaming startled him, he whipped around. His face was no longer human. It was canine. If I hadn't known any better, I would have thought the thing in front of me was just a dog. A sick dog, but a dog surely. Yet I'd just seen it transform. Its eyes were still human. They looked back at me with a sadness at first, as if the creature was maybe embarrassed. Then its gaze was angry. I'd seen something I shouldn't have. It was going to make me pay. It was on me in a second. I could barely backpedal out of its reach. I was still on all fours and I watched its long claws carve through my blanket with ease. It roared. I sprayed it in the face with my pepper spray. It yowled and recoiled and I knew that was my only chance to run. I got to my feet and sprinted for my grandparents' home. It was further than I remembered. With every step, I was praying that the front door would be unlocked. If I had to fumble with my key, I'd be done for. 
I'm sure my grandparents feared it too. That's probably why. I sprinted, panted. I ignored the painful white hot stitch in my side. I risked a glance back toward the monster. It was done pawing at its eyes. It was glaring back at me again. Then it was running. God, it was running. It tore across the earth like a machine. The rumble in its chest may as well have been a screaming engine. It shredded the ground, kicked up the grass and dirt, and it closed in on me with ease. But I was already on the front porch. I was already wrapping my fingers around the door handle. Then I burst inside. I crashed onto my face and forearms. I turned around wildly and kicked the door shut. The beast didn't have time to slow down. It slammed into the door. I heard it crumple against the solid wood. I scrambled as quickly as I could, turning the latch as it started to rake its claws against the frame. It spit and cackled and made sounds no animal should make. The ruckus woke my grandparents, of course. My grandfather fired a rifle through the door three times. That quieted the monster down. We peeked through the windows. We opened the front door. It was gone, of course. It was smart enough to know that it couldn't contend with a bullet. It was a long time before I slept outside again. The nightmares were pretty consistent. They were unforgiving. Sometimes it felt like the moment I closed my eyes, I'd be back in that chase. I wasn't sure that I could escape the monster every time. I'm sure my grandparents feared it too. That's probably why we never talked about it. Although I did catch my grandfather peeking through the windows whenever the night got dark. Eventually, I got brave. Eventually, I laid down beneath those stars again. I haven't seen the creature since, but that doesn't mean I've forgotten it. I always remember the important things. In the back half of my life, that means carrying a gun when I'm outside. I don't know if this counts as a cryptid encounter or not, but it was definitely something far beyond the normal scope of modern zoology. That's for sure. I was on a kayaking trip in eastern Virginia. My route was about 30 miles, but that didn't take as long as you'd think with how fast the water was moving. It was only a two-day, one-night trip. I parked my car at the end point of my route and had a friend drop me off upriver that morning. I'm pretty experienced with a kayak, but that was my first solo trip. And after what I ran into out there, it landlocked me for about five years. I wouldn't even go into a swimming pool. The area I was kayaking was fairly remote. It wasn't dangerous country by any means, but it wasn't easily accessible, even by foot. The forests around that area are thick, and the underbrush makes it difficult to hike unless you are on groomed trails, which there weren't many of. Funnily enough, the landscape would seem a prime location for a Bigfoot sighting, but that isn't the creature I saw. Most of my trip was going according to plan. I did get hung up on a fallen tree and took on some water before I was able to free my boat. But things like that happen, and I just dumped the water out when I stopped for lunch and went on my way. I was on the water a little longer the first day than I had planned. I made good time, but it was around sunset before I stopped to make camp. I remember seeing something moving under the water as I beached my boat and drug it up onto shore. It didn't make a splash and I couldn't get a good view of what it was before it headed for the safety of deeper water. I knew for sure it wasn't a fish. We have a type of large aquatic salamander called a hellbender that is native to the area. They can get pretty big, about five pounds, but sightings are rare. If you are lucky enough to see one in the wild, it is a sign the river is doing well. They typically hang out in shallow water and hide around large rocks. They pose no threat to humans. I didn't think too much about the creature and started setting up camp for the night and started my dinner. It was nearly dark by that point, but the moon was full and reflected off the river, casting a faint blue glow across the landscape. There was a slight breeze that night, and the only sound across the entire valley was the wind in the leaves. That was one of the reasons I loved spending my time in the outdoors. It was so nice to get away and enjoy the silence. I had done a lot of camping up to that point. I always stored my food away from camp and washed up before settling in for the night, making sure not to draw the attention of hungry wildlife. I'll admit, bears do make me nervous, but I never had any problems with them before. I stored my food in a dry sack and hung it in a tree about 100 yards away from my tent. I could see the tree from camp, but just barely. 
I watched the sun set below the water and I thought I saw something moving along the surface. At first, I thought it must be a waterlogged branch or tree that had fallen into the water. It was getting dark so I couldn't see it well. I stared at it trying to focus my eyes. Suddenly it moved again. It was like a giant snake, or if I didn't know better, I'd say it was a sea serpent. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on my. They had to be. There were no sea serpents in the rivers of Virginia. I had a long day on the river, so with that thought, I got ready for bed. I drifted off to sleep without another thought of what was in the river, but the mystery would soon come knocking at my door. I was awoken in the night to the sound of something sniffing at my tent. I could hear the creature moving on the grass outside, but I couldn't hear footfalls. I thought the worst. I thought it was a bear. I stayed still and silent and prayed for the animal to move on. I didn't have any food in the tent, nothing at all that smelled, not even a chapstick. The creature stayed at my camp for about 10 minutes before it decided there was nothing worth its time. I heard it bump into my kayak as it left. I stayed still in my tent for another 15 minutes before venturing out with a flashlight. There was no sign of the creature when I emerged. I searched the ground for footprints, but I couldn't make out anything discernible. I breathed a sigh of relief when I realized I was alone, but then I looked to the tree with my food hang. There was something wrapped around the base of the tree, and it looked like it was starting to climb. It looked like a giant snake from that distance. I was dumbfounded. We have snakes native to the area, but nothing like that. I left my camp to try to get a view of the creature. I had to know what it was. It seemed preoccupied with reaching my food bag, so I figured I was safe as long as I didn't get too close. I kept my distance out of cowardice, but I moved in close enough to see that it wasn't a snake that was climbing the tree. It was a salamander. It looked like a hellbender, but about 10 times the size. It must have been 12, maybe 15 feet long, and the middle of the creature was more akin to that of a snake than of a salamander. It was literally as if a sea serpent had grown legs and could walk on land. That's the only way I can describe it. I know it seems impossible, but I know what I saw. Unfortunately for me, the creature managed to reach my food and have itself an easy meal that night. I watched the entire thing happen, but I dared not confront the animal. It ate until it was satisfied, and then waddled down the embankment and disappeared beneath the water's surface. I can tell you one thing for certain, and it's that I was not at all thrilled about putting my boat back in the river that morning. The entire way back to my car, I was searching for signs of that thing. Luckily, I didn't see it again. My brain tells me that it must have been an unnaturally large hellbender. It's not unheard of for fish, salamanders, and turtles to grow to absurd sizes when food is plentiful and their habitat allows it. But then, how do I explain the creature's elongated body? Is this just something that happens when they grow to such a size? Or did I meet something else out there on the river? The heat had been something that year. Insufferable. It had been so hot that a person might do anything to escape the Texas sun. I know I was willing to do a lot. I was willing to agree to take a trip with my friends. A little excursion to the west of the town we all grew up in. I was even willing to help pitch our tents right along the riverbed, only to make our trek to the cool water that much shorter in the mornings. It was cold by the river, and we were thankful for that. It was even colder with the water up to your shins. And that was glorious. Walk far enough out and you might even find the tender current rising as high as your shoulders. We would have held our heads underwater for hours if we could have just to escape the sun. Lucky for us, the trees were gracious. The cedar and elm formed a ramshackle canopy, a poor imitation of a real jungle, but they did enough to filter out the sky's harshest rays. We thought we'd found a little weekend of heaven, but we could not have been more wrong. Between the four of us campers, there was a firefighter, a welder, an aspiring survivalist vlogger, and a line cook. Under normal circumstances, we could have thrived out there. We could have established our own little community and fallen off the grid if we felt like it. Circumstances became abnormal on the second night. While the rest of us retired, the firefighter opted for a late night swim. None of us were particularly concerned, considering the river never flowed at a dangerous pace. After we zipped our tents shut, we heard some splashing. 
That was uncharacteristic of the firefighter. We listened, each of us isolated in our tents, when we heard a grunt and a sudden scream, and we simultaneously leapt to action. All three of us discovered that we weren't the type to be paralyzed by our fear in that very moment. Despite our quickness, when we emerged from our tents, the firefighter was gone. The river was still. The woods were quiet. We laughed and congratulated our friend on a prank well pulled. But he didn't come back. We waited. We searched the area as well as we could in the dark. Exhaustion was heavy in our bones by the time dawn started to arrive. It became easier to search the more light that we had. The survivalists found some tracks leading away from the water, so we all followed them. Funny enough, the tracks led to where we parked our vehicles. We all had a laugh as we made our way back to the road. We had set into a dire panic instead of considering that the firefighter had just gotten spooked and ran for the cars. We figured that he was probably still asleep in the back seat of his vehicle. But we were wrong about that too. His car was gone. He hadn't just been spooked, he had been terrified. He left his phone back at camp, incapable of calling the rest of us. Before we could finish scratching our heads, a branch snapped in the woods behind us. Something was moving in there. It was heavy. It had to have circled around us as we arrived on the road, cutting us off from our campsite, cutting us off from our gear, our keys. But we weren't worried, at least not yet. We were shaken up, sure. We were suspicious, but we didn't know what we were facing yet. Then, when a man walked out of the woods with a face like a dog's, fear swallowed us whole. The stranger was covered in fur, and there was wetness in its eyes. Spit dribbled from its fanged mouth. Its upright ears flicked in the wind, turned to chase the sounds of the woods around us. Those ears folded flat against its skull when the creature's eyes narrowed at us. This must have been what had chased our friend. We didn't blame him for running. The vlogger muttered and pointed out that his keys were still in his truck. We now had a chance to get out of there after all. So we took it. We broke into a sprint all at the same time. Us three and the monster. We all vaulted over the hood of my small car and flung open the doors to the vlogger's truck. We jumped inside, two of us in the back seat, one up front. Up front, the vlogger got his door shut just before the beast arrived. The two of us in the back weren't so lucky. A clawed hand swiped for my leg as I got in. I pulled it back just in time. The creature was moving too fast to stop when it closed in on the truck. It crashed into the door slamming its own limb in the jam. When it recoiled to try a second time, we lunged forward and grabbed the handle. When the lock clicked, saving us all, it raked its long claws furiously against the glass. By then, the engine started, which made the creature flinch and jump back, clearing enough of a path for us to reverse and peel out of there. We left our other cars behind. We left everything behind. We found the firefighter at his house. He actually lived the closest. None of us said a word, all knowing that we'd all seen something that defied explanation. We stayed there for the night, and when the next day came, we went back for the cars. Whatever was left at the campsite stayed there. None of us wanted to go back in to gather anything. We'd had enough of a brush with a monster. We weren't going to open ourselves to a second encounter. It's been a few years now, and the story hasn't come up between us. None of us has told a soul, not as far as I can tell. I guess that makes you all the first, at least outside of our group. I'm sure you'll forget about it quicker than the rest of us. Unless maybe you've seen something too. Brockway Mountain Drive in Michigan is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I was in the service for almost 10 years. I saw a lot of the world and still, that place between Copper Harbor and the Upson Lake Nature Sanctuary is one of the most beautiful. But on that day in December, the beauty was lost on me. My car was a mess. It was this rusted old coughing Ford Escort mini station wagon. It was on its last breath, but I really thought I could squeeze one more winter out from it. But as I rolled to the top of the Brockway Plateau just west of Copper Harbor, I had had enough. It died. It would not start, and it immediately got cold as is all get out outside. 
I already had a rusted out floorboard that caused snow and slush to spit up in my face while I was driving, and the passenger window was double thick saran wrap duct taped together. When it died on the top of the hill, I took a minute and got out and had a smoke. I then prepared for the ritual. The ritual was me heaving to push the car down the hill and pop the clutch to get it started. Today, my hope was only to make it back home. I had to get a new car. The time had finally come. I put it in neutral and pushed the escort to the edge of the plateau, and with the driver's door open, gave her one last shove and then jumped in. Down the hill I went. I popped the clutch and for the first time, the damn thing did not turn over. It rolled to the lull at the bottom of the road and just stopped. Crap. Now I was stuck here until someone came along to give me a ride, and I had no idea how long that was going to be. And to make things worse, I was down to my last smoke. I did not even bother to push the escort off the road. I was so pissed off I just sat there and lit up my last Marlboro. I was leaning back, cold as hell and facing west, looking at the snow, trees and the tiny unlined patched up, pothole ridden pavement when a giant animal walks dead center. It was about 200 yards away. I almost choked on my cigarette. I felt all the hair on my body standing straight up. I lived in the Upper Peninsula, and we got so used to things, we sometimes forget that we are in the wilderness up here. And what the hell was this thing? I remember thinking, oh my god, as it stopped in the middle of the road, and just started casually walking towards me. It was so terrifying for so many reasons. It was big, and it was coming at me. I was alone in a car that would not start. I had no idea what the hell it was. I immediately started turning the ignition. Come on, come on, come on, I started screaming. I was about to get out and run back up to the hill to the plateau, to the east behind me, the same hill I just had rolled down, but to my shock, the escort started. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was so happy. Then, this crazy looking walking dog started yelling and began charging at me on all fours like a bull galloping at me. I wheeled the escort wagon around and puttered my way up the hill. I had already accepted death. That escort wagon would not make it get away from a child on a big wheel. All I could do was floor it and hope I purred up the hill and made it over the peak to the other side, headed toward Copper Harbor. I was so thankful the car did not die on me. I looked back and saw the devil spawn standing on the top of the hill, all proud and boastful, howling and screaming. Please make it back to town, I kept saying. And I made it back to town. After that, I did get another car, but I never sold the Escort. I just could not part with her after she had saved my life from that dog man. I live in a ridiculously small town of Vermont called Jay. We're right along the Canadian border. Aside from the town having very few businesses, we are also overshadowed by Jay State Forest and Jay Peak. We are in the middle of nowhere. It was Christmas Day and it was just me and my single mom. Also, I am not a child anymore. A teenager, yes, but I am not exactly thinking Santa is going to show up. We knew the year would be low key and quiet, so we just lined up a few movies to watch and made steaks for dinner. In this part of Vermont, it wasn't uncommon to see a moose or a deer family come through from the forest past our home. The town was quieter than usual because of the holiday. This brought down more raccoons and bears than usual, looking for food in the cold Vermont winter. Hearing the bashing of trash cans became part of everyday life, and this Christmas was no different. We FaceTimed with my sister, who is living in New York City. We also spoke to my aunt in California. The day was fairly ordinary, and the food was good, but again, dinner just like any other day. We gave each other a few gifts, but even that felt underwhelming. I was looking forward to my mom going to sleep, so I could play video games and not feel like I was ignoring her. The PlayStation was in the living room, which overlooked the road in front of the house. On the opposite side of the road was the forest. The television sat in the corner next to the window, so it is hard to not see movement outside, even when you are sucked into a big game. Around 11 o'clock at night, after my mom had been asleep for a while, I heard more trash cans banging around in front of our house. I had taken the trash out earlier, and the dinner scraps were in there. 
I figured it was a raccoon trying to get whatever was left on the bones to bring back to its family. But as I tried to ignore the noise, it got louder, like something was digging to the bottom. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed movement and could tell that it wasn't a raccoon. Probably a bear? I thought I should look so I could make sure whatever it was. Chances were good that it would just run away if I scared it. It wouldn't get aggressive or try to come for the house. I told my online friends that I needed to step away because something was getting into our trash. They laughed because none of them live anywhere near as remote as us. I laugh with them because I watch animals dumpster dive all day. My laughing stopped though when I saw what was actually outside. I pulled aside the curtain and could see something, very human-like, bending over into the trash can. Human-like, but completely covered in fur. It was not shaped like a bear. My breathing must have become heavy because one of my friends could still hear me and started asking if I was alright. All I could say was that I needed them to hold on one more second, my voice cracking with fear and disbelief. My eyes widened as a guttural growl resonated from behind the garbage cans in the alley. Something was there. The next thing I knew, the creature emerged, and the sight of it made me start to short circuit. Its eyes were glowing with an unnatural, sinister yellow light, and they were fixed on me through the window. There was an intelligence in those eyes, a predatory glint that I had never seen in any animal. They seemed to pierce through me. The face was hideous, a terrifying blend of man and beast. Its snout was filled with razor-sharp teeth exposed in a snarl that could send the bravest person running. It was like a werewolf, but more man-like than dog-like. The head was adorned with a ragged mane of dark, matted fur, and the ears were pointed and alert. Its body was muscular, the strength evident in its broad shoulders and thick arms that ended in gnarled claws. Its torso tapered into a lean waist, and its legs were powerful designed for both running and standing. It stood on its hind legs, displaying an unnatural balance and poise. From what I could see, it looked about seven feet tall, a towering figure that seemed to defy nature. Its posture was erect and it carried a sense of authority, like a leader among its kind. I couldn't take my eyes off it. It seemed to study me too, perhaps contemplating its next move. The creature wiped its mouth of whatever he was tearing through in the garbage, but continued staring at me. I couldn't think and had forgotten I had my friends on the headset. They were trying to get my attention, but all I could do was stand there, thinking that either I was seeing things or I was going to die. I noticed that the Christmas lights from the window were still on, as well as the tree. I put my controller down and reached for the plug, not taking my eyes off the creature. He looked angry as if me looking at him disturbed his meal. He looked like he would pounce if I were standing outside closer to him. I pulled the lights out of the wall which seemed to startle him. He jumped a bit, knocking over the trash can and making a loud noise. I heard my mother jump out of bed so she must be hearing it too. Just then he took off in the direction of the forest. My mother came downstairs and stared at me silently, in shock. She must have seen it too, but didn't know if I had and didn't want to scare me. My friends were still on the headset trying to get my attention. I snapped out of it and told them I had to go, that my mother needed me. We both went outside to pick up the trash in the trash can. The whole time we didn't say a word to each other. I don't know how much she saw, but I know that I saw a lot. I don't like living here anymore. I've already made plans to move down to the city and live with my sister. Sometimes it's the little things that stick with you. Well, I wouldn't say this was a little thing, but it certainly started out that way. It was 1997 and I was working in the park ranger at the time, working in the Shenandoah National Park. I'd been there for about a year and loved it. The pay wasn't great, but the benefits were good, and I got to be outside all day every day. That part of it was perfect. There were two other rangers on my shift, the day shift, we worked 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. with a one-hour lunch break in the middle. My partner's name was Tim, and he was from the area, having grown up just down the road in Madison County. 
He knew this area like the back of his hand and had been working a park ranger for several years before I came along. I was still fairly new to the area though, so Tim would often give me little tidbits of information about where we patrolled each day or things he had learned over time while working there. One afternoon during our lunch break, he told me about some strange happenings that colleagues were talking about that had occurred at Bear Creek Lake State Park a few hours south of us. Tim said that he had heard stories from other rangers about strange sounds coming from the woods around the lake down there. He said that people thought it sounded like a woman screaming, but that it was much too loud and shrill to be human. He also said that he had heard some of the other rangers say that they thought it might be a Sasquatch or Bigfoot down there, but he didn't really believe in such things. I listened to Tim's story with interest, but I must admit I didn't put too much stock into what he was saying. After all, this was Virginia and we're not exactly known for our Bigfoot sightings. At least not that I knew of. Besides, we were in the middle of a national forest and there were plenty of animals out there making strange noises. It could have been anything. I mean, bears certainly made plenty of noise when they screamed at each other during mating season, and deer could be pretty shrill when they watched over their fawns. So I simply filed Tim's story away in my mind and went back to work. Bear Creek was far enough anyway that I didn't worry about it. That afternoon, we patrolled the north side of our area. We had a fairly large area to patrol, but it wasn't too bad since we could drive most of the time and only had to walk for a few minutes each hour. But it was during one of those walks that I first heard what could only be described as sounding like what we had talked about earlier, the Bear Creek Lake Screamer. We were walking along an old gravel road that led down to a small creek that fed into the lake. The trees were fairly thick here and there was still some deadfall from recent storms, littering the forest floor that we were heading out to check. I remember hearing something behind us as we walked down the road but didn't pay much attention because deer often move through this area and sometimes even walk down this road. But then I heard it again a loud cracking sound coming from somewhere in the woods just off the right side of the road and then a screech. It sounded like someone stepping on a dry branch and breaking it and then screaming, but it was much too loud and the sound was much deeper than normal. I looked at Tim who had also heard the noise and we both shrugged our shoulders. We couldn't really pinpoint what this one was. We kept walking down the road for a few minutes when suddenly there was another loud snapping sound from off to our right. This time I noticed that the sound seemed to come from a fairly large tree that stood about 20 feet off of the road and had grown to 40 feet in the air. The top branches were moving as if something had just jumped from them down to the ground and moved away quickly. I looked at Tim again who seemed just as surprised as me by what we saw, but neither of us said anything because we didn't know what it could be. I remember that my mind flashed back to Tim's story earlier in the day and wondered if maybe we had just encountered a Bigfoot. I kept that thought to myself though, not wanting to scare Tim. Besides, we were still in the middle of a national forest and there were plenty of animals out there that could have made that noise. It could have been anything, right? Well, we eventually finished our patrol in that area without incident, but that afternoon we patrolled the south side of assigned area and as we drove down one of the roads there, I once again heard that same cracking sound coming from behind us. This time the cracking was much louder than before. Again, my mind flashed back to what we had seen earlier in the day, and I secretly wondered if this was another Bear Creek screamer. And then sure enough, the screaming pierced through the air. It was shrill and loud and sounded just like a woman screaming. I looked over at Tim who had a look on his face that I have never seen before. But all he could do was just shake his head saying, I don't know what that is. We both looked around for a while trying to find the source of screams, but never did pinpoint anything. To be truthful, we only really half looked because I don't think either of us really wanted to find anything. And also, it was getting late in the day and that was a great reason to head back to the main office. So we eventually gave up looking for whatever it was and didn't have to feel too guilty about it. I thought about those sounds for a long time though, trying to work out in my mind what they could have been, and it didn't take me long to wonder if it could have been the Bigfoot Tim had talked about earlier, like maybe it had traveled north and was now in our area. 
I mean, like I said, I didn't really believe in such things at first, but after hearing those screams, I'm not so sure anymore. Besides, Tim told me later on that he didn't want to admit this to anyone else, because no one else believed in these things, and they tended to just laugh at him. But he said he had heard the screams before and knew what it was, that it was the same thing they had been hearing down south. Personally, I've never heard them again, but I do still remember that sound like it was just yesterday, and I find myself becoming more and more convinced that it was a Bigfoot after all. It's one of those little things that continues to stick with me. I remember the wings, and it was all our town talked about for a while. The wings and also the fire. Our little community is particularly special. We're a small town just like every other small town. Our one benefit, if I had to pick one, is our proximity to the lake. It's beautiful. You'd know the one if I said it aloud, but I'm not telling this story to draw attention to me or even to the town itself. I just want to talk about the wings. I need to talk about them. I thought it was just me seeing them at first, and it's hard to imagine that it started with me. I don't want to imagine that. I was dreaming of them. At night, the wings came, and I remember hearing them before seeing them. It was a dream I didn't remember, but I do remember that I woke up and the rhythmic beating of those wings was stuck in my head, hard and steady like the heartbeat of a sleeping giant. The sound didn't leave right away either. I carried it into my day like a migraine. Sometime after lunch, it disappeared. But the sound was back haunting me when I woke the next morning. I kept it to myself. Whatever it was, I wasn't ready to welcome any sort of medical emergency into my life. That was the only explanation at the time. Then I saw them, or I remembered seeing them for the very first time. On the third morning, I could recall the sight of those fur-covered wings. Something between a bat and a moth, I thought. It was some creature my nightmares were inventing. And although I had the vision of those wings finally in my mind, I still couldn't imagine the size of them. I couldn't visualize the creature alongside anything from the real world. It was still intangible, still unknown. And I guess that's why I was comfortable talking about it with my neighbor. She told me she'd seen the wings too. She said they had come clearly to her for the last few nights. She didn't know what it meant either. She only knew that they scared her. We were surprised, I think, that something had imprinted on the both of us so strongly that our dreams became linked. Had something flown over the town? We wondered. Had a movie come out recently with a wicked bat as the antagonist? We tried to laugh it off and invent a story that made sense. But we weren't alone in our discovery. It was my neighbor, as well as her neighbor, and theirs after them. All of us in the town had dreamt of these wings. And when we discovered that, all of us were frightened. It became real then, especially as the dreams intensified. Soon, it wasn't just the sound or the shape that we could see. In my dreams, the entire creature was revealed to me, while I had expected a bat or some sort of prehistoric monstrosity. The real monster was somehow worse. It looked like a man. His body was covered in short brown fur, obscured by dark circular patterns that seemed to move when you stared at them. His eyes glowed a bright red, and the wings, of course, were his own. The dream never left us. Each night, it was clearer. Each night, more of the figure was illuminated. The monster grew so bright that eventually we could see what was casting that light as well. Great orange-licking flames, flames the size of buildings. We knew by then that the creature was larger than us. We all had to look up just to meet its gaze. That meant the fires were historic in size, enough to engulf our town and all of the trees around us. But the longer it continued, the less we could do to try to cure ourselves of the vision, the rarer our conversations became. None of us wanted to admit the reason that we couldn't sleep. We just wanted to live our lives and forget the wings that were haunting us. Then, perhaps even faster than it had begun, the vision stopped. The town breathed a sigh of relief. We thought our nightmares were over and for the first time in a long time. We enjoyed a day of peace. When the sun began to set, someone screamed. 
fingers pointed at the sky and we saw it. We saw the figure in our dreams flying over our rooftops. It cut in and out of the shadows. The dusk was hardly bright enough to frame it. Only red eyes were clear in the creeping darkness. It was there. It was real. We could all see it. But with it came the fire. And suddenly our very last concern was the monster we'd seen in the sky. The trees were ablaze. The sky was smoke. We were evacuated as quickly and as efficiently as we could. Not everyone made it out of our town. The fires came too fast and we were too disoriented. Some of us, I think, thought that we were only dreaming. We stood around as the fires closed in and thought that we'd wake up before we burned. Most of the town was saved. Firefighters from all over rose to the occasion and saved the pieces of our lives that hadn't yet been covered in soot. After that, things were supposed to return to normal. In most ways, they did. The fires were extinguished and the dreams were gone. We were allowed to sleep again. But that didn't mean we'd forgotten. That didn't mean we didn't sometimes hear those wings on the wind. That didn't mean we couldn't see the fear lingering in the eyes of our neighbors. We became a quiet town, but now I think that was a mistake. I think the only way to escape those wings is if I finally talk about them. So, that's what I'm doing here. Thanks for listening. Hi Donovan. I'm writing in today with a weird thing that happened to me. I hope you like it. I've told this story to friends recently, and one of them listens to your podcast. He told me I should write in and see if there'd be any interest in this encounter I had. I want to start off by saying that paranormal experiences never happened to me. I had a pretty standard childhood, and I'm currently in my mid-30s. This experience, which happened when I was 25, was my first. For context, I had just graduated college but was having a hard time finding a job in the area where I went to school. Eventually, the lease on my apartment ran out and my parents offered to let me stay with them until I found some work. My parents had moved to a smaller town not too far away a few years into my college career. They, like many parents, wanted something smaller. One story because my dad has bad knees and just quieter in general. The town they moved to had more in it than my hometown, so they were close to stores, hospitals, post offices, and all that. Overall, I liked the house. It was cute, small, but fit the way their lives were going. They offered me the second bedroom, which was just being used for storage, and I moved in with a temporary setup. Their bedroom was on the other side of the house with a kitchen and a full bathroom between, so we had some privacy. For the first week, I just hung out with my parents, enjoyed a few home-cooked meals, and took it easy. Eventually, I needed to get to work trying to find a job. I had a laptop, but to give my parents some space, I'd usually head down to the local library and hang out in their community room. I spent a lot of time there the first few weeks just getting my resume up and running, joining job sites, searching, etc. I secured a handful of interviews and was able to spend a little more time at home relaxing before I went to work full time. The first experience I had was in the middle of the day. I'm a little ashamed to say I was actually taking a nap at the time. My parents were out shopping and I took advantage of a quiet house and passed out. I'm not sure how long it was after dozing off, but I woke up just feeling like someone was in the room with me. At first I was thinking my mom had come to wake me up. I opened my eyes just a tiny bit, in that half-awake state where your eyes aren't really open, but you can still sort of see what's around you. My room was dark, but something caught my attention. There was a figure standing near my door, and it looked almost beige in color. This made me blink a few times, trying to wake up and understand what I was seeing. Propping myself up on my elbows, I squinted to get a better look. I saw what seemed to be a ghost. I know it sounds strange, but that's the only thing I could think at the time. It looked like a young guy, just standing there, staring off into the room right past me. His form was vague and hazy, and he was varying shades of a soft beige color. I noticed him shifting from foot to foot a little, like he was restless or uncomfortable. Needless to say, I snapped awake, but I was too stunned to say anything or move. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. But even with all this fear and surprise, 
I didn't get the feeling that this was an evil spirit or anything like that. I held my breath watching the ghost as closely as I could without moving. Everything in the room seemed to be frozen, like time itself had stopped. After maybe 30 seconds, something incredible happened. The ghost just began to dissipate, slowly fading away. It was like watching fog vanish in the morning sun. I thought about asking my parents about this, but decided not to, knowing I would sound silly and they would think I was just messing with them. For the next few days, I didn't see the ghost again, until one night when I woke up and he was in the same corner. I turned on the light on the nightstand, but he still didn't seem to notice me. This time, he stuck around longer, maybe five or ten minutes before dissipating again. For about three weeks, I saw the ghost on and off, only ever in the spare bedroom in the same spot. He never spoke, moved, or indicated that he was aware I was in the room too. About two months later, right before I moved out and into an apartment nearby, I casually asked my parents who had owned the house before them. Another couple their age, they told me, with a few kids. I pried a little bit to see if they knew of any accidents, but didn't ask outright about deaths. They definitely picked up on the odd question and I let it drop. I've never found out why the ghost appeared in that room, and my parents have never brought up seeing him. Part of me thinks because he disappeared for my last few weeks there, and I never saw him again, that it was just a random event, maybe a spirit trapped in a loop that finally got free. At this point, I'll probably never know since it's been so long. I feel weird about bringing it up with my parents. They still live there, so maybe they'll catch sight of him one day if he ever comes back. But the experience made me realize that there's a lot more going on around us than any of us is aware of. I was driving home on an isolated road through thick mountain country. It was late and dark and I honestly couldn't have told you where I was. All I knew was that I needed to stay on the road that I was on until I finally left the state and hit home territory. I was bobbing in and out consciousness. You know how it is when you're exhausted and trying to push on. I had tried and tried and I didn't want to admit it. I had even chugged a rock star not too long before this. But my body was so exhausted that even the caffeine and the extra boost of that wasn't giving me what I needed. And I was too cheap to spend the money to lay up in a hotel. It became really hard when the rain began to fall, since that sound could put anybody to sleep. I was notorious for using white noise to help me sleep anyway, so that was just the nail in the coffin for me. However, when I was coming up on a bridge, this is where my story happened. My headlights lit up something that looked just like a person, except almost double, if not triple, in size. I had to swerve to avoid it, and I sure as hell woke up from that. I wasn't sure if I clipped him or her or it, but my car went sliding and went straight into a ditch. The first thing I did was get out to make sure that I hadn't just hit somebody. Why would there be somebody out here in the middle of nowhere that's wearing all black? There was no one around, and I was pretty sure that there had been somebody in the road. I was certain of it. And I was more than a little mad at them for not making sure I was okay. I swear, it felt like the rain had just begun, but my car was good and stuck, and the tires wouldn't grip the mud that was suddenly all on the ground. I didn't want to call for a tow truck, but it was looking like my only option. I sat in my car in the sound of the downpour and tried phoning out when I was sure I had seen movement, that was more than just the rain. I was hoping it was help, but looking around, it didn't show me anything to speak of. I shook my head wondering if it would be a good idea, just to sleep right here in the ditch and wait for the tow truck. It might be a little weird, but after all, maybe a good 45 minute nap is what I needed. My thoughts were shaken from my head when the driver's side window was suddenly blocked by the drenched furry body of something very tall and ugly. It was walking on two legs, but there was no way that this was human. This was a beast of the woods, the closest I've ever come to thinking of some animal as demonic. I never use that description, but this was so ugly and evil looking. It's the only word that I feel would be appropriate. It was pointing its snout right at me and baring its teeth in a menacing grin like it was smiling at me. 
like it was happy that I was trapped in this little metal container called a car. I briefly pictured those long yellow fangs sinking into my flesh. In fact, the worst part was its eyes. There was no soul in them. They were alive only with a strange cold light. I'm not exaggerating. They almost had a faint glow to them. It was supernatural in a sense. The dimness of the weather made that very clear. It ran its claw on my window, which made a squealing sound. And that's about the point that I lost complete bladder control. It was so sadistic, so evil. It drug its claws slowly over my window, all while maintaining a stare and a grin, like it was letting me know. Haha, you're stuck in there. There's no way you can run, nowhere you can hide. You're all mine. But I'm going to make you terrified before I kill you. That's the impression I got from this thing. Those claws were way too long for any practical purpose other than killing. I quickly jammed the lock button on my door, just in case it was smart enough to use the door handle. We continued a horrible stare down for what felt like ever. Another wolf thing came out from the downpour and then another one. I think in total, I spied four separate ones altogether. This was at the time when old man phones were the current phones and I flipped my phone open. Needless to say, I tried to get pictures, but they were crap. It looked like I had taken pictures of a movie playing on my TV. All at once, these things disappeared, and I found out why. A farmer-looking type of guy pulled up on the road and volunteered to pull me out of the ditch. After the job was done, I thanked him profusely and told him that I had almost become lunch for animals that I'd never seen before. I explained to him, assuming he had saw them, that they were upright wolves that looked like they were from hell. He got a look on his face and after that, I tried to ask him questions, but he seemed very dismissive. I've held on to these memories all these years, but again, they're just memories. Even when I've tried to talk to a therapist about it, they don't even believe me. It's just one of the stories that you can't hold in. I saw something, and more of them. This was a pack of animals. I felt like I was in a werewolf movie since they all looked very identical. Whatever this big one was, which was the biggest of all of them, by the way, was only mere inches away from my face, separated by a very thin sheet of glass. The only reason I'm alive, I believe, is because of my car window. But then again, this thing was so menacing, so large, and so powerful, I feel like it was just toying with me. Because if it really wanted to kill me, I don't see any reason why it couldn't have ripped my door open and pulled me out and killed me. You can't just carry something like this for the rest of your life and not share it. I'm sharing this with you in hopes you can help me get this out there to help quelch the fear of anybody else who feels invalidated by their own experiences and encounters or in fear of being mocked. I'm hoping that if you do read this, your audience can decide if I'm full of it or not. Regardless of that, I have the trauma and I will forever live with this story.